What? Oh my God. You're getting so many salutes. You're getting so many devil salutes. Why are you getting so many devil salutes right as the show starts? Because I'm trying to welcome you to the weekly spinner rack. Hello. My name is Chris. I'm going to be your host. We are going to talk about some pretty amazing uh, comic book news this week, uh, as well as, you know, reviewing the actual comics themselves that came out. This is going to be a good one, folks. This one is going to have just a caliber of jokes that's probably going to blast your socks right off your feet, right up your butt. That's just what's going to happen today. So if that's not for you, you know, you can go watch some other lower tier comic book channel of which there probably are a few, aren't there? There's sort of like a comic book YouTube sphere now that I uh, think about that. So so uh, maybe I shouldn't drive you away, but but pro I promise this is going to be a good one. Oh my God, my insightful, my insightful mind. It's going to like really give you uh, a new way of looking at the, uh, at the art of comics as I riff on the news. Um, and I've got a lovely cup of coffee that's going to fuel that. And that's brought to us by this week's sponsor, uh, Jeff Bezos Coffee. Yes, uh, Jeff Bezos and... Um, uh, Elon Musk, those are the guys that I really love, and uh, I'm here to just basically deliver content so that I can, in turn, have an excuse to advertise their products. That's that's what I'm all about when you get down to... Oops, I'm uh, revealing the the, the uh, mask. Mask off uh, on that one. Uh, lovely to have you uh, folks here. Uh, yes, howdy me hearties, says Jackie F., uh, presumably from the poop deck of a pirate ship. Uh, hello to Kevin Street. Not Avenue, not Court, Southeast, Kevin Street. Um, Inciseful, is that what I meant to say? Incite, inciseful? I, I don't know. Or maybe I meant insightful. Diana, always lovely to have uh, the, the brilliant uh, Diana. And hey, look, Diana. It's Yojo June, right? So I've got some sort of G.I. Joe stuff on. Diana, uh, you guys may know if you read the uh, the G.I. Joe comic books, she is uh, kind of the keeper of lore. She she is the, the expert there, uh, uh, credited on many IDW uh, comics. That's what we're talking about here, right? Comic books? That's a tough word for me to remember. Uh, yes party time just giving a shout out to some random people not picking and choosing favorites just so that you know hello a man and and samuel hello frangie uh frangie tells me to go um i think i'm going at a hundred percent to be honest i i think i i think uh i'm starting the show with some good energy uh and and look you know what i've done look at that i've earned two dollars folks thank you steve thank you happy monday uh to, to, he's saying happy Monday, not just to me, but to all of you. Thank you, Steve. Now that is a $2 very well spent. Um, I cannot personally guarantee that that gets you into heaven, but if there is a karmic system, I certainly think donating $2 to somebody that you don't even know in person, is the kind of a uh, really good hearted thing that probably like really, uh, greases the palms of, um, St. Peter or whoever, you know, is the bouncer at the pearly gates. Is it St. Peter? I'm not too up on my, uh, my Bible lore, but if they ever release it in a comic book, I'll probably become an expert. Uh, let's see. Uh, so yeah, this is going to be a good one, folks. This is going to be a really good one. Wait a minute. Out of void. It says missed you live last week. Oh, watch the replay. Okay. I was about to kick you out you know, ban you from my channel. Um, <laughs> I can't have that kind of, uh, uh, filthy betrayal of skipping a week, but, but you watched it once it was archived. And honestly, for me, that's just as good. I love it when you folks are here live. I get to chat with you, see your, see your thoughts and opinions. Um, I don't get to see that when it's archived, but I get that sweet, sweet YouTube pay-per-click, uh, revenue like about half a cent or something it's pretty awesome pretty awesome oh look at that 
we got our first Paste Pot Pete joke of the day. St. Paste Pot Peter! Uh, oh, okay, right. Gantris is pointing out that there, there are biblical comics. Uh, boy, I've got some weird sort of uh, light reflecting on my glasses but whatever whatever you know what that's not going to affect the quality of this show that's not going to uh here's what we're going to do we're going to talk about some news whoa all right steve just got into the uh the vip lounge at uh club heaven lies we met at new york comic-con uh yeah that's true we did we did we did uh and that was awesome i by the way It's uh, such a one-sided thing where you guys see me. I don't necessarily know you, but I think it's incredibly flattering and incredibly brave when people come up to me in public and at conventions and stuff like that and say that they watch my show. I it, it, I just want you to know, I always appreciate it. Um, I, I'm never getting so swarmed by fans that I'm like, hey, my wife and I are trying to have dinner here. Get those autograph requests out of you. That doesn't happen. Um, I was at the movies a couple days ago and, you know, just a, a, a really kind person named Carlos uh, just said that he watches my show. And that happens uh, every once in a while, a couple times a month or so. And uh, I want you to know I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily the most outgoing person by default, I sort of force myself to be an outgoing person, but, uh, but it's not my, it takes a lot out of me. I'm an introvert at heart, you know, after a social interaction, I feel tired. Uh, so I really appreciate it when people are brave enough to, to come up and introduce themselves and, and say a few kind words. It really means a lot to me. Look at this. Now, there you go. We're, we're doing the PowerPoint. Look at that beautiful thumbnail. I, I hope you guys know that I'm it, when I make these thumbnails, it um, it's semi-ironic. I'm sort of doing my riff on the kind of things that like super popular channels like, say, Mr. Beast do. And you guys were joking last week about my teeth. And I was like, hey, I've got good teeth. I know that you were talking about how they were um, extra white. And, and that was intentional because Mr. Beast's teeth are just so white in, in those uh, thumbnails. Um. What movie did I see? Well, first of all, I definitely saw Across the Spider-Verse. Uh, but the movie that the gentleman came up to me at was um, Shin Kamen Rider. And uh, I liked parts of it. Uh, I didn't love that movie. I really, really enjoyed uh, Hideaki Anno's Shin Godzilla. I had a great time at Shin Ultraman. These are sort of like, you know, just like, uh, sort of like a, an updated for the modern day reboot of these classic properties. And he did Common Rider. Common Rider's pacing was weird, man. There was a lot of exposition in the middle, and I was getting kind of bored. But um, anyway, uh, so that was the movie that I was at. Let's um, I don't want to give a spoiler uh review or anything, but but um, what I I'll give my brief thoughts on Across the Spider-Verse. Uh, let me acknowledge this. Thank you, Andrew Jefferson. Thank you very much. You, um, wow, with a, with a single super chat, folks, Andrew Jefferson was able to cut ahead and, and get into not just the VIP lounge in heaven, but getting bottle service. Uh, he says, don't, don't want to say too much about Spider-Verse, but I'm curious if you've ever choked out anyone with your well-defined muscles. Um, no, no, not, not in, um, not in real life or anything like that. Um, but I've practiced it actually in, um, martial arts. So yeah. Uh, I just highlighted that Michaela, Michaela, love having you here. Uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant person when it comes to comic book history, especially DC stuff, but all sorts of stuff. And Michaela says, Shin Godzilla is fantastic. Still haven't seen Shin Ultraman or Shin Kamen Rider, but I've heard mixed things. Um, Shin Godzilla is by far the best, but uh, yeah. So so let me just real quick, um, non, non-spoiler, non uh, Across the Spider-Verse is, uh, okay, it's going to sound cliche, but Across the Spider-Verse is a triumph in animation and storytelling. 
it finds a way in, you know, motion to capture some of the tropes of comic book storytelling in a very charming manner. We're talking things like editorial captions to explain things, um, sound effects that are used as gags. Uh, we're talking about the choices that they will use to help differentiate parallel worlds of different Spider-Men are very loyal to the art styles of the comics that they're adapting. For instance, when we meet uh, Gwen Stacy's Spider-Woman, the color schemes uh, of the backgrounds are very um, vibrant swaths of purples and pinks that really remind you of that uh, sort of uh, Rico Renzi uh, artwork in issue one with like Jason Latour writing. Uh, the the When you see uh, Scarlet Spider, it looks like they've illustrated it in a cel-shaded version of Tom Lyle's art style. And that's kind of lovely. Like how many times are we going to see something like very deliberately referencing Tom Lyle, who was actually a really cool artist in the 90s uh, that, I, that I appreciated. Uh, so there's a lot of really, really specific choices that they're making. Um, I, I've never seen such an ambitious type of animation really it, it's so ambitious uh so many art styles fusing together i thought it was beautiful i thought it was engaging i thought it was kinetic in a in a way that not everything is uh i love the story and the character growth uh, i think miles morales starts at a different place than the last movie it's not just a retread uh just just amazing the voice acting was was authentic and funny I loved so many of the new characters like Spider-Punk. Boy, was it a great movie. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like anything else I really get into would be sort of like uh, digging into plot beats. And, I, and I, I don't think it's important for me to spoil anything here. But um, even if you hadn't been considering seeing it, I sincerely think you'd be impressed with the music and the animation even if you're not a big Spider-Man fan, you're going to be impressed with that stuff. It's They put a lot of thought and hard work into this movie, and it and it shows. I was really... I went in with high expectations, and they were exceeded. Uh, one of the... It's going to be... <sighs> bigger than Fantasia. Uh, right. Like, I don't want to diminish uh, 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 an amazing creative achievement like that. Uh, Fantasia did some like the the most amazing stuff it could do at the time that this is sort of taking that to another level uh, but the amount of coordination it must have taken to to get this all working together is is really hard to comprehend it's on an impressive scale i would um i would definitely say it'll end up in my top 10 of the year for movies uh even saying it is animated is a huge spolier spolier as they say in france spolier Anyway, uh, I, I recommend it. I can't wait to see it again. So, uh, no, Ho Ho Hobie Brown is not a Miles variant. Hobie Brown is a variant of Rocket Racer, actually. Uh, in the 616 universe, he is Rocket Racer. And in uh, his universe, he became Spider-Man. So, uh, it's not always Peter Parker Miles or Gwen, every once in a while, it is somebody different. So, let's move on to this first piece of news, which, coincidentally, is tied into Spider-Man. Just a tidbit here, but, uh, yeah, two days ago, Marvel's uh, Spider-Man account tweeted that the Superior Spider-Man will return. Uh, if you don't know Superior Spider-Man, this is great timing for me. The newest Comic Tropes episode that I created uh, went up yesterday, and it is about me arguing that Superior Spider-Man, uh, the story arc, was actually very, very good. Uh, and essentially, uh, it involves Dr. Octopus swapping minds with Peter Parker, uh, leaving Peter for dead, and taking over as Spider-Man. A villain is, is running the show in Peter's body, and that's just the jumping, jumping off point for a story that I think has 
exceptional character growth, uh, some twists and turns, but still gets to the heart of what it means to be not just a hero, but Spider-Man specifically. It just allows us to look at the relationships in a different light. Uh, so I liked it quite a bit. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, you know, some people have like criticized that there's like plot armor in terms of uh, shouldn't Peter Parker's friends and family have, have noticed that something was wrong. Uh, that's sort of fair, but at the same time, Peter is a bit flighty, right? And he's disappearing on people like Aunt May and MJ all the time because he's Spider-Man. So for him to sort of push people away, uh, not necessarily enough, I don't think, to 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 twig everybody's uh, internal spider sense. And just to be clear, uh, some people are suspicious about him, uh, specifically eventually MJ, but Carly Cooper, his uh, NYPD friend, uh, did think about that right away. You hope it, it isn't all about suffering. I, I didn't think that it was necessarily all about suffering. I don't know. I, I liked it a lot. I, I'm not saying that you have to, but I liked it. Just to be clear, um, I, I've made an episode about Craven's Last Hunt, and I think overall that is my personal favorite Spider-Man story. So maybe I just like the idea of uh, these short-term things when like another person takes over a hero's role. Maybe that's me. Steve, I, I don't want to read that because this is assuming that I don't know this news and that it's not in the show. I appreciate the super chat, but trust me, folks, I've got everything on here. I've got everything. Uh, Tavia says uh, Mary Jane should have figured it out, especially with Doc Ock replacing Spider-Man Peter Parker. Uh, she she does have questions. Keep in mind they were um, just reconnecting uh, right before Superior Spider-Man story arc um, came together. Um, I don't know exactly how this new version will work, but it does mention that um, Dan Slott is going to be writing it again. Uh, so anyway, we'll see. For instance, is this definitely going to be Dr. Octopus again? I don't know. Uh, it could be a completely different uh, thing, I suppose. But same logo and everything, Superior Spider-Man, we will see. Uh, I really hope you will consider taking a look at my episode. Maybe that's all I cared about was just sort of like giving myself a plug. I don't know. So I just uh, went over some of my thoughts on the Across the Spider-Verse movie. Oh, you know what? I just thought of a little tidbit that I wanted to talk about. Uh, at the movie theater, they were giving out posters. Cool. Uh, posters painted by Bill Sienkiewicz. Yes, please. Love Bill Sienkiewicz. Uh, and I'm looking all over the poster, and I don't see his signature. And I uh, do a Google search, and I find one that does have his signature. Uh, the version that they're handing out in the theaters has put the Spider-Verse logo right over it. Um, and and yet, I can tell that they photoshopped it out so that there wasn't like a little bit of it sticking out. So I don't know. Uh, I don't love it when they do that. Look at this. You met Dan Slott at Fan Expo Philly this past weekend. Oh, that's very recent. I hope his uh, beard was on point. And uh, that's really cool, uh, Steve. I, I haven't been to a... a convention in a little while, but I'll be going to one in about three weeks, something like that. Yeah. Looking forward to it. So there was news on the red carpet of across the Spider-Verse here that is, is like, they're going to be a live action Spider-Woman, live action Miles Morales. Uh, the producers of the movie seem to hint at that uh, specifically. So uh, Sony's producer, Amy Pascal, I don't think she's the head of Sony anymore, but she's still produced this one. Uh, she said that a uh, uh, these 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 two characters, well, maybe not these two specific characters, Sp Miles Morales and Spider Woman were the ones mentioned, and, he, and she said, "You'll see all of it. It's all happening." Um, on a related note, you know, voice actor Shamik Moore has said he'd love to try to play the role in live action; that he would give it his all. Um, I think he sort of has the right look. He certainly sounds like it, um, but you know, there's also this fact that he's 28 and miles is more like you know at most 16 probably really realistically more like 15 or so 
I just feel like that's um, that's really sort of pushing what 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 audiences are, are going to be comfortable buying into. I, I think it's just a little too old, Shamik. Uh, Avi Arad still around and producing some of these Spider-Man movies. Um, they got him out of the MCU stuff, but he he's still got his finger in the uh, Spider-Man pies, Spidey pies, and uh, he said that there will be a spider woman movie sooner than you expect. Uh, that was his quote sooner than you expect. He did not clarify if it was Gwen Stacy, if it was Jessica drew, if it was somebody else, let me pitch this to you though. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Sony you're doing like these movies about like Morbius and you know, just to be clear, spider woman and, and miles Morales. Yeah, they make sense. Spider-Man 2099 folks, you could make a movie about, Miguel O'Hara. And uh, there's a lot of great comic stories. He's an interesting character. And you wouldn't have to really worry a whole lot about how it connects to anything else. Because he's canon, but he's in the future. And he's got his own really interesting world. Uh, please, folks, consider Miguel O'Hara. I think that that's, that would make more sense than, say, Craven or something. But that that's me. Gantris, thank you, buddy. Thanks for the work you do. Thanks for it. Thanks for the support. Thank you for the support. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I felt like I saw a comment that I was going to read. Blah 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 blah. As long as Nicholas Hammond plays Peter Parker like he is in the 1970s Spider-Man show, I'll watch these films. <laughs> I would love it if they somehow brought him back. You know, like there is a, a third movie coming. Uh, if we saw a cameo of, you know, uh, Japanese live action Spider-Man and 1970s American TV Spider-Man, I, I would love it. I would flip out for something like that. I mean, it, I know they can't justify more than a cameo because not enough people know those characters, but I would get something out of that. I, I really would. Um, where was that comment? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Yo, Jim. Jim, love having you here. An important question. Did our buddy Neil Breen do any voice work in the new Spidey flick? No. Uh, that's my sole criticism, just to be clear. How do you create a Spider-Verse movie with dozens, maybe hundreds of Spider-Men and not hire the best overall actor uh, in our generation? Uh, or in any generation, perhaps? <laughs> a thespian and a um, auteur who knows no creative limits. Uh, what, a, what an oversight. What an oversight. She is now known as Ghost Spider, yes, but uh, was originally known as Spider Woman. So, yeah, Spider Breen. Isn't that immoral? They should have him play uh, somebody like the Mad Thinker or the Tinkerer or somebody like that. And he's got like a bunch of computers, a bunch of laptops. That would be fun. I can't believe he's not in it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. You saw the first screening? Well, I guess that makes you the uh, 2006 fan of Spider-Man. Congratulations. Anyway, uh, great movie. Uh, be curious. Oh, by the way, since he's there, since since he's here, let me highlight that again. Uh, Jim posted to Twitter and um, Instagram a bunch of his designs that he did when he was working on Into the Spider-Verse. Uh, if you folks haven't seen that, that's pretty fun. So you get to see Jim's take on characters like, I want to say Prowler. Definitely, I know Spider-Ham was in there and Spider, the Penny Parker mech, um, all sorts of interesting Spider-Man ideas. Uh, so yeah, Jim did some designs and he's shared that on his uh, social media. You should take a look. Take a look. All right. Hey, look at that. That's great news, Clay. I'm really glad that you got the Vampirella uh, cover. Thank you so much for the support. That was really, really fun. That was, that was a great project. We've got more news than just that. We've got one more piece of news. <laughs> uh, yeah. What you're seeing here. Dr. Octopus is going to be reincarnated as this little girl. What? Yeah. Marvel's Japan account. Uh, and look, 
I'm really loosely translating this, uh, but they're saying that Dr. Octopus is going to be reincarnated as a Japanese junior high school girl. That story is coming out on the Jump Plus uh, platform. That's their digital platform of Shonen Jump by Shuisha. Uh, June 20th, so, so this month. Uh, but here's what's interesting to note. It is by the creators of My Hero Academia uh, Vigilantes, writer Hideyuki Furuhashi and Betten Court. Betten Court, a very good artist. So weird idea. Uh, could be fun. You know, we've seen him. Uh, we've seen Dr. Octopus wake up in Spider-Man's body, but waking up as a little girl, that's uh, that's a weird one. I want to say thanks for supporting my stuff so much. Hoodie, I love you, buddy. Um, I'll always support your stuff. You're like one of the most entertaining guys out there. I think you're amazing. Oh, that's so nice to hear. That that, that, that really does my heart good to know that people are getting their copies of uh, of my, my silly little cover. My silly little cover. Uh, <laughs> you're going to pass on that one? Well, you have to read it in Japanese just to... Uh... I wonder if it'll be on the U.S. Jump Plus app. You know what? Probably eventually it must. It must. Maybe they would do a, a simultaneous release, actually, now that I think that through. Because that's sort of what they're aiming to do, is more and more of that. And this is based on an American property. There's probably a really good chance that they would release this uh, really like this month here. I just want to say, it seems like reincarnation is really popular in manga right now. Uh, what's that one that's really popular? Oshinoko. That's about like, you know, um, a gynecologist getting reincarnated as one of the twins of a pop idol that he helps uh, give birth to and he's killed during that and he gets reincarnated as her son. Uh, just seems like reincarnation is a popular idea or somehow going back to like a younger age with your knowledge. Tokyo Revengers features... Um, uh, what's it hanamichi uh i think it's his name was hanamichi he like you know wakes up in his teenage body so yeah it's kind of weird kind of weird that, that that time i got reincarnated as a slime there was one of the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy books which i love douglas adams Boy, his sense of humor, I encountered that very early on. And honestly, it, it it shaped my life. Like Douglas Adams shaped my sense of humor in a huge, huge way. I know that there was one book where the main character, Arthur, uh, met his arch enemy that he never knew about. It was this guy who kept getting reincarnated throughout all of time and space. And every time Arthur accidentally caused his death. Uh, so he was very angry and Arthur had no idea who he was. That was pretty pretty awesome but um i don't think i don't think douglas adams ever touched a comic book he uh he did some doctor who he did hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy in many different formats he wrote a couple other great books um boy was he funny boy was he funny and i just a pity that we lost him kind of young aaron thanks for jumping in and joining us i uh, love the new episode of comic tropes that run is very special to me since uh, it was a major book I was reading in high school with my friends. That's great to hear. Thank you. Oh, yeah. City of Death is a great Doctor Who episode. Totally agree, Chemdog. Very, very good. Very, very good. <laughs> I loved that joke so much as a kid. He had statues of Arthur killing him, and he carved them himself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Dirk gently did have Thor in it, but not the Marvel Thor. Let's move on to see what other news there is. There's some really crazy news this week. Um, CBR, Comic Book Resources, is definitely one of the more visible channels, uh, channels really more, websites, about comic book news, right? Oh, my God. They are, uh, they are, they are not having a good week uh, in the public eye, in my opinion, at least not with hardcore comics fans. So, Comic Book Resources is owned by Valnet, first of all. Valnet is a digital publishing company from Canada. Um, they bought CBR back in like, I want to say like, it was either 2014 or 2016, okay? Probably 2014. They bought it uh, from Jonah Wyland, who had started it all the way back in 1995. So Comic Book Resources has been around for a long time. 
Uh, this past week, Comic Book Resources laid off three people. Editor-in-Chief Adam Swiderski, Senior News Editor Stephen Girding, and Senior Features Editor Christopher Baggett. And then, this was posted to Valnet's internal Slack channel, but somebody leaked it. So I'm going to read just a piece of what they had to say, because they, they, they let these guys go, and then they kind of drag their name through the mud, but there's more to this story, okay? Oh my God. It's, they go, CBR will be undergoing major structural changes related to turning the corner on both culture and performance. And after a little more bullshit, they continue, they go, certain roles no longer exist, and we are focusing on individuals who can create a more positive culture moving forward. Okay, without naming names, they kind of imply that they got rid of people because they weren't contributing to a positive culture. Well, wait till you hear why they really got let go, according to other people there. Um, and by the way, just to be clear, the, Greg Katzman was just like last week, he moved away to CB, from CBR to IDW. So that's four of like the nine senior executives that CBR lost in a two-week period. Um, Comics Beat followed up on this story. Comics Beat, by the way, pretty good journalism source. They, they I, I think they deserve more um, credit. Uh, they reported that management was actually pushing for the writers at CBR to deliver more content, um, that they were like lowering the pay per click. Um, so they were like really working these writers to the bone. And these guys, Adam Swiderski, Stephen Girding, and Christopher Baggett had stood up to Valnet and said, that's too much, you know, like it's not fair. So Valnet let them go and then said that they're not contributing to a positive uh, culture. That's the allegations of the, um, the the reports that I'm seeing. And these are two tweets by people that used to work at CBR. Um, Megan Damore now is like um, an associate editor at Marvel, for instance. And she said, the only reason I stayed at CBR so long was because of people like, and she mentions, um, I guess, Steve Girding and Christopher Bag Baggett. So the idea that they were fired to create, quote, a more positive culture is an effing joke. Valnet got rid of them because they actually stood up for their co-workers and employees. Uh, Samantha Puck also used to work for them. I'm trying to remember what she does now. She's she's still in comics. She works somewhere else. I'm sorry, I forget. Not necessarily relevant to this piece. But she says, I haven't spoken publicly about this because I didn't want to burn any bridges. But Valnet is a monster. In 2019, I was promoted from one editor uh, position to another at CBR and given an accompanying pay increase. But six months later, when upper management talked about raises, anyone who had accepted a promotion wasn't eligible because we got raises when we took new positions. As a full-time section editor expected to be available 24-7, I made $2,000 a month. When I asked for more money, I was fired. Oh, these are a lot of people that work for them that are saying some pretty awful things. I just got to say like, ouch, you know, these are turning into content farms. Uh, it's, it's probably not going to be too long until places like this just have like chat GPT, write Junk articles. They just like say, Hey, chat GPT, uh, Tell me about the 10 most popular Spider-Man runs. Tell me about um, the the 10 times that Miles Morales was close to death. You know, I mean, that, that'll get them almost the same SEO if it, if it like brings in clicks. Uh, they, they do a lot of listicles, CBR, you know, there's other websites out there about comics that kind of do that too, but they do still have some good features and good news. Um, there are people there that work hard to uh, follow up on press releases, interview executives and creators and stuff and, and get some news to us, uh, get some insight. And uh, I appreciate that stuff. I'm just passing this stuff on. I'm not the one that's like uncovering this news. So uh, it's it's it, it, it's awful to hear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to be clear, like, you know, like I don't make a whole lot more than that off of like YouTube, but, and that's why I've got a part-time job, but there's no boss like telling me that I have to do extra or do more or anything like that. Oh yeah. Brian Cronin at CBR is amazing. His, his, 
his knowledge of comic book history, or at least his ability to uncover interesting things, uh, puts mine to shame. Brian Cronin seems like an absolute genius for what it's worth. Yeah, there's another person, that, Brian Cronin. Like it, the stuff he does, it. it, it I'll be honest. He's giving away stuff that, like, if he did that as like YouTube, he'd probably make a lot more money. Just my guess. I don't know. <laughs> ten times Peter Parker has eaten a sandwich, and ten times he's eaten a burrito. They could tell ChatGPT to write that. They could publish it, and that headline is enough to get people to click on it. So we'll see. Let's see. There was an awful German gossip magazine that claimed to interview Michael Schumacher, but in fine print, it was just an AI. Ugh. Michaela also pointing out that Brian Cronin is lovely. So if you guys haven't looked it up, he's got an amazing series of uh, comic book history. Oh, absolutely. I like too much coffee, man. It's that's that, yeah. Um, Shannon, right? Uh, Shannon Wheeler. Is that who does it? I'm, I'm terrible at names. That's all. Yeah. Only surviving columnist from the pre Valnet days. Well, I hope uh, he's getting taken care of. And if not, like Brian, like do something on YouTube. Uh, is CBR dying? I would not say that it's dying. I would say that it could be putting themselves in trouble because it seems like the parent, the owners are trying to wring blood from that stone. Isn't that the phrase? I just found like, like this eye opening to hear about like how little people were getting paid for, for writing there. And um, it, it made me sad. It made me sad. You know, comics, we, <laughs> We do this because we love it and you can get successful and make some money, but there's so many roles in comics and comics media towards the bottom where people just get chewed up and spit out and uh, it's gross. It's really depressing. It's really depressing. And uh, with that, I'd like to just sort of uh, end the show on a sad note, leave you all with some tears coming down. Um, it's what I get off on. <laughs> uh what was I thinking of that? Like, um, it's not related to this. What was it? Uh, I was thinking of, uh, my favorite kind of art, but I'm being ironic here is, uh, you know, when, a when a celebrity dies and that very day, an artist, uh, doesn't just draw a tribute to them, like a portrait, which is classy, but draws like their ghost meeting some other recently uh, deceased celebrities and they're all just like really happy to meet each other as ghosts. Uh, love that as long as their body is still warm. That's my favorite. I also love it when um, somebody who's played a lot of famous characters when they die and those fictional characters surround their grave. Uh, that as, as long as that body hasn't been dead for 48 hours, mm, that's my favorite kind of art. That's my, that's just mwah. love that stuff. It's such a, it's such a big thing though. <laughs> yeah. I didn't look for it, but I'm positive. Somebody drew say like auntie entity from, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, uh, Mad Max beyond Thunderdome, like mourning the death of Tina Turner. I'm sure somebody drew that. Dropping a coin into the general fund, medical, new computer, et cetera. There is an etc. Uh, really enjoyed the Superior Spider-Man comic tropes episode on my morning commute. I hope it distracted you from driving. Uh, no, <laughs> thank you very much for watching. Thank you for the support. Uh, thank you for dropping a coin to your Witcher, and um, that's really really nice. Yeah, see, like if you're being funny there, Wally, but like Bill Sienkiewicz's portraits are such a classy tribute to somebody that's passing away. Uh, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong uh morally i think it's a beautiful thing if you do your best to draw a portrait of somebody that you appreciated that's passed away but when you sort of like draw them meeting other ghosts and when you draw their characters really sad about it i just feel like it's so tacky it's so tacky i'm trying like if if i died tomorrow and somebody drew me like high-fiving stan lee and um I don't know uh, who, who played Black Panther, like, you know, like high five in both of them. I'd be like, mm, thanks. That's that's beautiful. 
Great. Just what I wanted. <laughs> uh, we've got more news to riff on. But C not CBR, Valnet. This is out there now. We've got these accusations. Treat your people right. Pay them what they're worth. You're going to... Companies, companies in general, you do better if you retain talent. There becomes um, knowledge. There, there's a term for it, a type of knowledge. But like, you know, when you've been at a company for a while, you gain knowledge about that company and how to make things work more efficiently and better. Uh, if, you know, somebody like Brian Cronin writes really good articles that bring people back better than if you ever used chat GPT. Treat your writers well. Hey, look, it's my sister. And guess what, folks? It's her birthday. So uh, maybe throw in a happy birthday, Jean, for my sister for uh, dropping in. Th that's it. Institutional knowledge. Institutional knowledge is a uh, non-physical but very valuable thing. And I don't think enough companies uh, value it properly. A bunch of people saying it. Okay, okay, great, great. You guys have an education. You got big brains compared to my little pea. Got it. I don't got enough wrinkles on my noggin raisin. Got it. <laughs> Here we go. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. Look at all this. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you, yes. Um. Hope you're done with work. You've got to be on the East Coast. Uh, yes, Chadwick Boseman. I, I really want Chadwick Boseman's ghost to be high-fiving my ghost if I die this week. Happy birthday, Gene. There should be some presents at your house from me. Have you guys ever uh, um, picked up an artist at IDW? If you haven't, oh my God, they are amazing. Like, it really is one of the best things IDW creates. Uh, they'll have basically scans of the original artboards, you know, no no colors or anything. And you get to see, you know, um, sometimes the underlying pencils or blue line. You get to see patches and whiteout and screen tones. It's really interesting to see an artist's approach. It's uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a it's a it's got, you know, commentary and stuff on it. And um IDW this week announced that they signed an agreement with DC Comics to release some new books uh, in 2024. Uh, they didn't have a specific date, but I bet you anything that they'll release them right around San Diego Comic-Con and New York Comic-Con. That, that just seems likely. But anyway, we've got a Neil Adams one that has a bunch of his work for DC in the 60s and 70s, when a lot of people will argue he was at his creative height. Uh, and they'll have David Mazzucchelli's Batman Year One. Wow, two great artists! Like those are both like you know they're 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 a little bit pricier, but, but uh, yeah, you know what, um, Andrew? I've looked through tons of them. I've got some friends that have some. I actually don't own any. I love them. Um, you know that there's a price tag to them, and I and I just haven't always splurged. If you know, if I if I was rich off this stuff, maybe. But yeah. The Albert Moy editions, right? Like the original art type stuff. Let's see. Uh, you are on one today. What's with the energy? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, I found this uh, uh, thing called uh, cocaine. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm just trying harder. I'm just putting in a little more effort. I'll tell you one thing that's a little different. If I have a little more energy, I'm not in quite as much pain as I've been in the last uh, several months. I got a series of cortisone shots to my shoulder and it hurts but nowhere near as much as it, it hurt like folks you have no idea like my, i should have been getting an oscar for the acting level i was putting on to, to to like get through life and pretend like i was doing normal i was in excruciating pain the last several months and now it just aches now it just aches so yeah that that's the difference that's probably the difference. This is this is me normal. This is me normal. Um, yeah, I got good news. Uh, last Tuesday was a little intense. Uh, you know, like the the shots are sort of numbed, 
but sometimes they like go like basically just about to the bone and all of a sudden you feel like a jolt of pain that's a little intense but whatever you know you get through that and then they put in saline solution which sort of helps lubricate my um frozen shoulder lubricate like the joint but at first it just forms this big bubble on top and it feels like somebody's physically like slowly dislocating your arm from your shoulder socket it one of the most intense pains I've felt in my life. I will be honest. One of the most intense pains. But it's worth it because I'm doing a little bit better now. It doesn't hurt quite as bad. And then later that day, I had to get what's called a cystoscopy because I was worried about some, like, cancer. I think I shared that with you guys. Good news. It seems to verify that I am cancer-free. Uh, so that is excellent news. That is the best news we could hope for. Uh, worth it. But I'll tell you something, cystoscopy, not much fun. In fact, I don't think uh, I don't think it's for me shoving things up the penis. Didn't love it. Didn't love it at all. Uh, yeah, I'm going to take a stand and say that it was unpleasant. I'm going to take a stand. But anyway, good news, right? Pretty good news. Happy to share that. Um, still have some pain. But it's not nearly what it was. So it's really good news. Really good news. And thanks. So everybody's saying really nice things. I appreciate that. M Mickey says uh, pain isn't fun. Mine's getting worse. Thanks to meds not helping. Glad you're getting treatment. Even having a little relief is a godsend. It makes you so grateful. Uh, I hope that your physicians can figure something out. Let's see. Some people pay good money for that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, they probably do. It's uh, not for me. Not for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's called sounding, isn't it? Like people that like it. Oh, I hated it. I hated it. Just to be clear, I did not like it. Did not like it. That was an Audi for me. I, I've, I've, uh, I would say just about all my orifices. No, that's not true. Things you want sound to go into your ears. You want taste to go into your mouth hole, uh, down into your food sack. But anyway, anyway. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> we're still making George Santos jokes. What a, his cameo in Spider Verse? What didn't he play Miles Morales? That's more than a cameo. <laughs> Let's see. Cancer free is the way to be. At least for now, it looks very, very good. So that is nice. It just means all I had done was pass some big kidney stones. That was not fun. Mom says, please stop. I'm just being honest and talking about medical procedures. <laughs> I don't know why she's, she, you'd think she'd be happy that her son does not have cancer. Uh, sorry, I've got some energy and that I'm uh, trying to entertain my guests. How, how dare I, right? You folks want me to just be like, uh, and also, also in the news, uh, it seems like Marvel is releasing three new comics next month. Another piece of news here. We've got uh, DC Comics has canceled two titles. Uh, come on, I'm going to talk about this stuff. I'm going to talk about this stuff. What else we got? Um, this was interesting to me. The, the, this is the modern, modern case of variant covers done to the extreme. This is the extreme angle. Um, you can't see this probably super well, but... What you see there is a uh, variant cover drawn by Howard Porter for DC's uh, upcoming book, Night Terror's First Blood. And what they were doing was a one in 666 variant, as in for every 666 copies that a store ordered, they could order one of these variant editions. DC decided to cancel it, but a bunch of stores had already planned on getting it and had put it on eBay. For instance, this is ANZ Comics had listed it as a buy now for $2,094.90. What? It's not even out yet. And they were listing uh, for somebody to buy it now. Wow. Wow. I, I know the variants are popular, but uh, would anybody out there actually pay $2,000 for, for a variant cover by... Uh, Howard Porter? That just seems bonkers to me. Maybe they were just seeing if somebody would bite, I guess. 
Um, there, I saw a couple others that were like a thousand dollars and six hundred dollars and stuff. So like, it's not like everybody put it up for this price. That was the highest one I saw out there. But oh my god, what? I don't care how rare it is. If it's brand new, I just can't see how it how it can actually have that value. That that's so weird. But then again, if somebody pays it, I guess it does have that value technically, right? It's like whatever people will pay is what the value is, but it just bonkers to me. Um, does anybody know who ANZ Comics is? I, I should have looked that up. Let me let me let me Google that out, out of curiosity. I should have looked that up to for, for this news. What was I thinking? I'm no journalist, folks. I'm no journalist. I should have looked that up. ANZ Comics. ANZ Comics. Looks like they're in Houston, Texas. Uh, and on Google anyway, they've got, um, customer rating 3.1 stars out of five. That, that isn't bad. That isn't bad. Houston based comics store selling exclusive comics. Okay. So they specialize in variants that, that that's what they specialize in. Yikes. So weird. Huh? I don't know. That just seems crazy. Yeah, I know you guys are saying that it stands for Australia, New Zealand sometimes, but no, I, I knew that it was here in America. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm no Sarah Jane Smith. Uh, the doctor is never going to take me on any adventures. I, I'm not much of a journalist. You know, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, free shipping. So then again, then again, okay, let's re let's, let's take a step back here. Is $2,000... A lot to pay for a comic. Yeah, but free shipping. Free shipping. Hey, maybe they maybe they even put it in a bag and board. I mean, that's worth, you know, a dollar. 50 cents anyway. Uh, what is the math on that? 666 copies are what retail to get the one? Yeah, yeah. Um, Variants come in different like types of rarities. Um, you know, like you might only have to order 10 copies of a book and you can order one of a variant and that one would be fairly common. It would be a variant, but like, you know, it, it would be produced at the rate of less than one out of every 10 because it's just you have the ability to order it if you order 10. This one, DC, was not going to produce many. It was going to be an, um, like a cardstock, nice cover. And they were just going to produce, they, they would allow a store to buy one for every 666 copies they ordered. You can imagine not many stores are going to order 666 copies. They're certainly not going to order whatever the devil of it. You know, I'm not a math magician. I'm not going to figure that one out in my head, but yeah. <laughs> you wonder how they got that number. I mean, obviously, Night Terror is like scary. Uh, 666, Devil. Yeah, like pretty pretty clever stuff there. Um, it's not as good as like one out of every 69, but yeah. Right. A lot of stories probably aren't going to order too many copies, but some stores do specialize in um, moving a lot. Um, or basically, so think about it. Like if they could get $2,000 for that one, that might help offset how many of the 666 copies they're going to be stuck with for a while, but I don't know. It's a little weird. Right. Cardstock cover, free shipping, probably a bag and board. They might put it in a gem mint mailer. So, you know. All right, Will. I'm not impressed. You had time to put that together. You had time. And wait, that isn't that isn't even right because it would end in a two. That isn't even right. <laughs> I don't like that math. All right. Joe Casada, you guys might know him. He used to uh, be the creative head at Marvel for quite a long time. Uh, what's he doing these days? Um, well, he did a cover too two for uh, DC. But uh, he announced he's launching a free Substack newsletter. A lot of people have Substack newsletters in comics, but most of them do charge a little something. Joe says that his is going to be free. Um, and he, it's called drawing the line somewhere. You might want to subscribe because, uh, this is a guy that has a lot of talent drawing and a lot of connections in the industry. And he's saying things like, um, some of the stuff that he'll have on his newsletters, he'll have art tutorials. He'll have all sorts of behind the scenes stories about the industry, um, interviews with other creators. So a lot of cool stuff. A lot of those. <laughs> Will he admit he was wrong about one more day? I don't think we're going to get that. No, I don't think that that's what he's going to talk about on his newsletter. 
Uh, I had frozen shoulder and physical therapy solved everything after a couple months. Uh, it was difficult, but years later and the pain is gone. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I went through three months of physical therapy and it helped it initially and then it got worse. But but I'm doing better, a little better now. I don't have full range of motion. Let's see. So like I can raise this arm all the way up, right? Like that's no problem. This one I can, that's as high as I can get. Like I can't, I can't lift it higher than that. And that, and that hurts. But anyway, I think that Casada could have some interesting um, content on there though. Like even if I don't agree with everything he did creatively and I don't, but he did do some good stuff as well. Uh, I respect his art. I think he's got some great connections so that he could have some interesting interviews. I would love to hear some of his behind the scenes stories. I think that it could be really good. See what, yeah, you say put my hands in the air. Like I just don't care. I put them in the air because I did care. Oh, Makoto just burning Joe Casada. He's going to get back in the bed and put, pull up the covers. You're really burning him there. Hmm. Yes, not everything he did uh, was great, but he also did um, guide Marvel to um, a lot of success when they were coming out of a bankruptcy and they were like in a tough part of time. So he did some good stuff too, folks. There's a new creative team coming out on Captain America. Um, wasn't one that I would have guessed. Writer J. Michael Straczynski is uh, returning to Marvel. I didn't love his Spider-Man run with like spider totems and a lot of supernatural stuff, but I did like his stuff on books like Thor and that. Uh, I do think he is a talented writer uh, in terms of character growth. Anyway, he's going to uh, be on the Captain America book with artist uh, Jesus Saiz starting September 20th. Uh, Jesus just did some excellent work over the last year in Punisher, by the way. And uh, JMS uh, was in an interview with io9. He had a quote here that I'll read. Um, Overall, the goal is to do some really challenging stories, some really fun stories, and get inside Steve's head to see who he really is in ways that may not have been fully explored before. Well, uh, that's kind of vague boilerplate stuff, but I do think that he does attempt to do stuff like that. I think that both his Thor and Spider-Man runs did attempt to uncover a new angle into a character's personality and thoughts. Um, before we get that, there is issue 750 coming out really soon, and that's going to have a bunch of stories, including by some classic um, Captain America writers like Dan Jurgens and J.M. DeMatteis. DeMatteis' run was really strong, by the way. Um, some other creators, like Gail Simone says she's got a small story in it. They've got some something by George Perez. I know he passed away, so I don't think it's a reprint. I think it's something that was never published. Um, John Ramita Sr., Gary Frank, John Cassidy. So issue 750 could be fun, too. Could be fun. Let's see. The story actually sounds really interesting with teenage Steve encountering real-world Nazi rallies in a pre-war U.S. If that really is a piece of it, I would be interested in seeing more of that. Like, we don't explore a whole lot of Steve's young life in the past, really. Um, we get him referring to it, but I would be uh, I would be up for seeing a little bit more of that. Yeah. Could be really cool. Uh, let's see. Ba, 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 ba. Oh, yeah, I'm not reading that one. Kyle's talking about the current Cold War story is getting a little ridiculous with Steve fighting Sam over the same things every issue. Yeah, I don't get that. Um, we'll see how they've got to become friends again. They got to become buddies again. Let's see. I like Straczynski's writing. His Spider-Man was good and his Thor was solid. He's not as crazy creative, but he's got a nice solid base of why the characters work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Saez is, um, uh, really, uh, uh, an interesting talent draw draws confidently in a style. That's not necessarily like a popular style. <laughs> Cap and Indiana Jones. That could be fun. That could be fun. Is the Punisher returning to TV? Um, well, technically, yes, because he's going to be on the Daredevil 
born again show, but like getting his own show. Uh, that's the rumor. My time to shine. Hello is, uh, you know, an industry uh, person uh, doing scoops, getting them scoops of comic book, new, com not comic book news, uh, movie news. I got scoops and scoops of movie news. Just taking my, my morning scoop, shoving it up into the Hollywood Hill and dropping out the dirt. Uh, that Hollywood doesn't want you to know or see. Uh, let's see. So, yes, uh, the rumor is that Disney Plus is developing an MA rated Punisher TV series and starring John Bernthal. I don't know, man. That doesn't seem like the kind of thing Marvel would go after, but maybe they, they, they probably want to keep, uh, you know, the, the, the copyright on the character by, by doing something active with it. Um, and John Bernthal is a good fit. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, I didn't know this. Uh, Chem Dog uh, points out to me that uh, Saez drew Nick Spencer's cap run. I did not know that. So he has worked on Captain America before. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh, Crython, you just came up with the best, best idea possible. Forget him after the super soldier serum. We want to see a young Steve Rogers as a newsie. Ideally doing coordinated dance moves with other newsies up and down the street. Disney's the punisher. And maybe like Tinkerbell just goes like, he, uh, I think that that's what, <laughs> and he wants photos of Spider-Man. Y'all with them jokes. Y'all got these little jokes. Uh, we'll see. I like to uh, keep my finger on the pulse of Webtoon stuff because I do think that it's, uh, I think it's still growing. I think that Webtoons are going to keep getting bigger personally. I, I don't think that they're a fad. I think that they're going to get bigger. Well, Here's one of them. It's a horror romance webcomic. It's um, getting a TV adaptation. It's a step uh, towards more mainstream uh, visibility. It's called Red Fox. Uh, it was a webcomic from Korea, as many of them are. Uh, ran from 2017 to 2019. It has been published in English by publishers like Net Comics and Tappy Toon. It's about a killer fox. He can shapeshift, and he just goes around murdering humans until he falls in love with one. I don't know a whole lot more about that because I haven't read it myself. Uh, but there's going to be an anime adaptation either by late 2024, or early 2025 uh, by a animation company called Annie Plus for the Korean streaming service Loftel. I definitely would not be surprised if that simply got translated and brought over here. So I think it's definitely uh, something we might see if in a year or something like that. Well, it should sound messed up. It's like I say, the first what's the first word I use there? Horror. <laughs> it's not it's not a uh, all happy go lucky in horror. Horror you typically involves something that would disturb the delicate human sensibilities. Ooh. Yes, it's called Red Fox. <laughs> How did I not pick up on that? It is called Red Fox, but red with one D, not two. Uh, Lamont, you big dummy. Ah, uh, for those folks who don't know what we're talking about, it, which is very reasonable considering when it came out, but there was a uh, sitcom called Sanford and Son that starred an old timey vaudevillian comedian named Red Fox. Uh, so yeah, and his catchphrase was calling his son Lamont uh, a big dummy. We'll see if that's any good. Shuisha is launching a new imprint. And this is tied to, I, I intentionally put this article after the last one. There's a, there's a thematic relation. See if you can find it. We make a game out of this show. Uh, it's a new digital imprint uh, coming out in 2024. It's called uh, Jump Tune. Jump Tune. And it's not Shonen Jump. It's not Jump Plus. It's Jump Tune. And the difference is they are going to be designing vertical scrolling comics, the Webtoon style, um, as compared to just digital 
translations of uh, their existing material. Uh, and they're starting things out with a jump tune award. Very Shuisha thing to do. They're going to give one winner uh, 1 million yen. Submissions are due by August 31st. Uh, those are going to 1 million yen. Um, I want to say that that's something I, what's that? I'm doing math in my head. We'll say $7,000. Am I doing that right? Somebody put that in like a, um, a currency converter and let me know if the math that I did in my head is right. Or if I'm missing a decimal point, but I want to say ballpark $7,000. I, I, maybe I'm way off. Maybe I'm way off, but anyway, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah. So they want to develop a uh, vertical scrolling comics. Uh, that's why I think that this stuff is still growing. Uh, Sh Shuisha is a massive publisher folks shown in jump. You all know about, but, uh, yeah, now they want to create this 10,000. I, th I feel like the, uh, dollar to yen is, is a little different. Nowadays it must be like seven to 8,000 bucks. That That's what I was thinking. Right. Uh, the connection is both logos are in red. Uh, that is a similarity. Now, we're talking about vertical scrolling comics. Um, anyway, regarding the uh, the prize, it's going to be held. But let's see. First, we've got Shuisha editor Takanori Asada. And he worked on books like Bleach and One Piece. So, you know, like he's worked on some big stuff. He's the new head of Jump Tune. Uh, the the whole he's the head of the whole editorial department. He's going to be a judge. Another judge will be um, South Korean webtoon company Red Sevens CEO Hyung Suk Lee. Seven hundred. Wait, what? Where's? Oh, seven thousand one hundred sixty-five dollars and eighty-four cents. So actually, I was pretty damn close when I said seven thousand dollars. Yo, I'm ready for September. I can do the conversion in my head. Let's go. Let's go. Let, do the kids still do this one? The cabbage patch? Yeah. All right. All right. Hey, I, I mean, I ballparked it at 7,000, and that was pretty darn quick. That was pretty darn quick. Hey, it's a nice little prize. Uh, somebody's going to get it, and um, I'm sure that because the way of j Jump works where, you know, like their, their readers actually vote on what they want to see continue and stuff like that, it tends to mean that there's always a cream of the crop that rises to the top. It never stops. Uh, it, it's going to pop. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you know, you can expect to see that stuff adapted into, um, you know, anime and toys and stuff. I was on a show this past week, as long as we're sort of talking manga stuff. I was on previews, uh, as in, you know, uh, Diamond Distribution. They release previews magazine. Well, they've got a, a YouTube channel uh, run by my friend uh, Troy, who I knew um, when we lived in D.C. together. He still lives in that area. And I was on a roundtable discussion, just having fun talking about the differences of um, manga and uh, American comics. And uh, I don't want to recap that, but it, it, it did get me thinking of one thing that I think uh, manga does very well is they surround the manga with adaptations that are all very loyal and you know you get the toys you get the animation you get the video games you get a whole range of packages and one of those could be your in you might not read every or, or, or absorb every type of that entertainment but there's all these different things whereas spider-man has action figures it has a video game and stuff but it's all sort of different you know it, it it's not like one necessarily brings you into the other because it isn't one unified vision all the time yo i'm making money think of that folks i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna have like 10 yen to uh i'm gonna have 100 yen to bring to japan in september thank you robert thank you very much buddy that's nice of you meow nian saying um hey hey see Cream of the crop. Bonesaw is ready. Snap into a Slim Jim. Anyway. Um, I, I just think that that's something that helps uh, manga is, is and, and you know, you have to be some of the best. They don't adapt the, the, the stuff that, that's short term. But if you have a hit, it's going to be adapted into all these things that are very 
um, loyal and share the same vision. And then whenever that story ends, if it's really popular, another creator might sort of reboot it or make a sequel, things like that. But I, it's nice that it all sort of fits. It's nice that it all fits. You learned English through Spider-Man Hostess Fruit Pie comics? That is the best learning English story out there. I, I refuse to believe anything can top it. That is, I want to believe that, whether you're saying it as a joke or, or not, I want to believe it. So, you know, that that old Fox Mulder X-Files poster with the UFO says, I want to believe, that's me for this story. I want to believe that somebody learned English from Hostess Fruit Pie ads. I love that. I love that. You have made my day, sir. Or ma'am. I don't know. I don't know. That's beautiful. Anyway, jump tune. Uh, I won't be surprised if we hear it uh, a lot. Yo, you know what? I have no idea really how you get into that field. You probably have to like, you know, like live in a town that like New York or, or LA or Vancouver or something like that. And know a bunch of people and stuff like that. But I think in another world, if I had the connections or knew how to do it, I think I would be a good voice actor. I do. I, I'm going to flatter myself and say, like, I think I, I don't know how to do it. I would love that job. I think I would nail it. I think I would nail it. I don't know. How many people can do Skeletor's voice? Everybody can do Skeletor's voice, right? Uh, I don't know if I can or not. I'm not going to because that might get me canceled. <laughs> That might get me canceled. I am always going to show up for an Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips book. They are, they are my personal favorite creative team. Okay. I love crime comics. I love both of their work. I love their work together. And I'm excited for them to return to doing more uh, uh, books about, um, what do you call it? A uh, uh, reckless in the meantime, They've got this new book that was just announced, Where the Body Was. By the way, uh, Colors by Jacob Phillips. They Image announced this this week, coming out this December. And uh, here's their description. Let me just read it. Because, boy, is it out there. A boarding house full of druggies. A neglected housewife. A young girl who thinks she's a superhero. A cop who wants to be left alone. And a private detective looking for a runaway girl. These stories all collide one deadly summer in Where the Body Was, a tale of love and murder in the suburbs told from a dozen different points of view. All the neighbors on the block have an opinion about the murder and how it happened, but which of them is telling the truth? Is this some sort of like a Rashomon type look at a crime? If so, how ambitious. Um, I love it. I love it. I need to hit the auditions in LA. LA is a little far away. I don't, and I don't think that they just have people like walk up. I don't think that they just let people walk up, but if anybody of uh, knows how I can uh, do it. Yeah. I'll, I'll audition. I'll, I'll, I think that, anyway. Oh, I think that they have to be up there. Yes. I, I, we've talked about this, uh, you know, a couple times because anytime I talk about Brubaker Phillips, uh, it seems to lead to people talking about really good creative teams that work well together. Um, yeah, Archie Goodwin, uh, Walt Simonson, um, Dave Gibbons, Alan Moore, Jack Kirby, Stan Lee. Yeah, I think that, like, definitely. Oh, I absolutely will pick it up. I pick up anything they do, and I've never been disappointed. Some of it I love more than others, but I've never been disappointed by them. They are so consistent and so, boy, crime is not an easy thing to write, where you can, like, lay out clues so that a story makes sense, but not reveal too much so that like the reader gets ahead or way too far behind the characters. I think I sincerely personally think that it's got to be the hardest genre to write a mystery or a crime story. I think it's the hardest. And I think that these guys do it like just, they make it look easy because of how, how smooth it is. Just so good. Yeah, Pulp, Phil, Phil Denier is, is, is saying Pulp was amazing. Totally agree. Totally agree. Pulp was something special. Like, it was definitely a high point. I've really been enjoying the Reckless books. 
Um, I love that these guys are at a point where they can take six months and put out a full graphic novel so that I can read a full story. I don't have to read it as floppies. I kind of like that a lot. I love reading a full story and for crime, it especially works well so that you're not necessarily forgetting details that you first read like two or three months ago. You know, people do say that, that comedy is hardest. I think that it probably depends on who you are. For somebody like me, comedy just comes naturally. Like anything I say is just, you know, going to tickle your funny bone. But uh, yeah, I think that, that, that that's, you're right. Comedy is probably very hard for certain people. I definitely think it's hard as an actor to do, to do comedy. Watchmen is kind of a murder mystery. It absolutely is. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm excited for this. I hope you guys have uh, tried some Brubaker Phillips books in your day. And if not, maybe this December 6th. Here's just a fun one. Some Marvel fans, these two gentlemen, obtained... Together, a world record for tattoos. Specifically, this uh, svelte gentleman on the left of our screen is uh, Canadian Rick Skolmiero. Skolmiero? I'm sure. I'm sorry, Rick. I, I'm sure you're watching. Anyway. Uh, and then this is American uh, Ryan Logsdon. And you probably could have guessed that but if you were told one of these guys is Canadian and one of them is American. Guess which is which. But anyway, they have tied the world record, according to Guinness World Records, for the most Marvel tattoos on a body with 34 Marvel characters each. Rick here originally held the record back in 2018 with 31. So Ryan went to beat him. And while he was um, sort of applying for that, uh, Rick got three more. So they both they both tied. They both have 34 tattoos. Um, the cool thing about like um, Rick's are like all over the place. And he he said like, you know, he's running out of room to put tattoos because he's got other things. Um, Ryan probably could do more. He's got this back tattoo with all sorts of different art styles. Uh, but, you know. That's okay. You know, clearly the Hulk here is Alex Ross. We've got a um, John Romita Sr. Green Goblin. I don't know, maybe a Greg Land Mystique or a Stuart Immonen Kingpin. I'm kind of guessing on some of those. Uh, on, on this sleeve, it's all villains. I see Dr. Doom and Baron Zemo and the Hydra symbol. And this uh, sleeve on this arm is all heroes. I know I can make out Vision here. Um. And yes, uh, Archmage is right. Uh, the the end of this is uh, Marvel is suing them both. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> Bruce Lee and Black Widow sharing the cover. There you go. Yes, yes. Rick has has both represented there, as well as Tupac and presumably his own kid. If not, I don't know. That part's a little weird. But yeah. If you did this, if you did this, how would you go about getting it done? I would want this. I would want everything done in a consistent style, not necessarily trying to duplicate the art style of a, a comic book artist. I would want the tattoo artist's interpretation. And I do like the idea of sleeves, like and, and good and bad on, on one side and the other. I like that idea. I, I, but I guess I like organization then. I guess I like organization. So I want consistency. How does a tattoo artist do an Alex Ross design? The tattoo artist must be pretty damn talented. It's not like a copy machine. Absolutely. There's talent involved there. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, it's impressive. Hmm. That said, tattoo artists today do have access to technology that tattoo artists, you know, a couple generations didn't have. For instance, you know, you can make a um, transfer of art and temporarily like sort of put that on somebody's back and you're, you're almost like not tracing, but you know, you're following it and stuff. So that could help. That could help. I was a little surprised that the world record was only 34 tattoos. I guess I just would have thought somebody out there had more than that. Thanks, Andrew Jefferson. 
Ever read Hot Lunch Special? First of all, no, I don't know that one. Jorge Fornes drawing gangsters fighting over the Wisconsin truck stop sandwich rackets. Really? I like the idea of that. Hot Lunch Special. Hot Lunch Special. Hot Lunch Special. I'm trying to drill it into my head. I like that. I like that. I need to get a tattoo of a big bucket of paste on my chest. Well, you know, in my younger college days when I experimented, I would get a few. No, I'm just kidding. That was not something that happened. <laughs> this story disgusts me. Go to hell, Vladimir Putin. He, uh, what you're seeing here is a contest that Russia is having right now for children to draw Ukrainians getting killed, basically. Uh, it's called the Heroes of Russian Victory Contest, and it was funded by a presidential grant. So yeah, Putin had his hand in this. They asked children to compete to draw a comic book that would show Russians patriotically killing Ukrainians. Because they're at war and all. And the story specifically links the bravery of Russian soldiers against Nazis in World War II to the modern day, what they're calling Ukrainian Nazis. So it's all, uh, what do you call that? Propaganda, calling Ukrainians Nazis. That's horrible. That's horrible. Uh, they put together a prize, a 3 million ruble presidential grant worth, that's worth $37,000. They got, they got, so, you know, if you're trying to decide which contest to, to join the, um, jump, what is it? Um, jump tune at Shuisha, their manga contest, or the Russian, you know, horribly bigoted contest. There, there's more money in this one. Uh, and the co comics were chosen as the genre because, um, according to the grant, uh, comics are an extremely popular genre among the youth. And, like, basically the language in this stuff is, like, calling Ukrainians Nazis. And there's all sorts of different uh, entries just showing them getting blown away. It's horrible. It's horrible. Putin has resorted to kidnapping able-bodied men off the street to become cannon fodder for his ego. I think it's more than um, his ego. I think he's, I think he's lost it. Like, I, I think he's, I think he's unhealthy mentally and physically. Anyway, obviously you'd have to be a Russian to enter this contest. So I wasn't being serious about like trying to um, do this one. I just, it's sad because probably the kids that are contributing to this think that they are being patriotic. I'm sure that they're not being exposed to what's happening in the real world. They're, they, you know, they get like state propaganda in the news. They're, they're not getting um, other points of view. It's become cool to trash Russia again. Well, they are kind of uh, our enemies and uh, they are a nuclear power. So I would say that it's, Healthy to be afraid of the government. Uh, I don't blame the citizens there. I would love to visit St. Petersburg or Moscow. I would love that. I would love that. Right now, I don't think that that would be a very safe move to do. Um, but it's comic book related, so I wanted to share it. I've got a kitty acting crazy back there, don't I? Uh, yeah, they heard me. Anyway, pretty depressing. Pretty depressing. Uh, and, and, and the irony of calling Ukrainians Nazis when you're acting like fascists here. Hmm. Just sad. Just sad. Moving on. Moving on to, to happy fun time news. Uh, no, <laughs> it's not. This is... It's all gossip and grease on this show. Yeah, my kitties are acting crazy these days. Uh, they woke up and chose violence today. Here's a, uh, I came down to get ready for my show and a bunch of comics were all knocked down on the floor. I found uh, that they had done this to my copy of Miracle Man for inexplicable reasons. And I can't get mad at them. They're just being kittens. They're very, it's just whatever. <laughs> They they trashed it. They trashed it. They they woke up and chose violence. Let's talk about uh, 
the comic book union. Comic book workers union. Uh, that is a union at Image Comics. And the comic book workers union uh, filed unfair labor practice charges with the National Labor Relations Board on May 20th. They alleged three counts of unfair practices by management uh, since getting their uh, contract ratified. So, boy, it really does not seem like the uh, small staff at Image is very happy with their jobs. Uh, but I don't know the whole story, but here's some of these allegations. Okay. We've got three charges. Uh, the charge that image instituted a work rule prohibiting solicitation of employees or dissemination of literature during work hours that the union alleges unfairly restricts the union's protected organizing activity. Somebody help me parse that one. What? They instituted a work rule prohibiting solicitation of employees or dissemination of literature. I don't get what they mean by that one. Sorry, I'm too stupid to get that one. Uh, the charge that Image rolled out a new work procedure unevenly, which led to unfair disciplinary action, and that disciplinary actions, quote, have increased exponentially, that they're being conducted improperly and are being conducted without required notification of the union or allowing union representatives to be present when employees are being disciplined. That one's fairly clear. Um, and finally, the charge that Image implemented a new policy that only affected one employee, a member of the union's bargaining committee. So the actual specifics I don't know about. Hey, Kitty, do you want to show up? Do we have a guest star? Do we have a guest star? No? All right. Thought that th thought that you were going to get a guest star. Um, boy, it... it Oh, that makes some sense, Tent Ringer, that they banned union newsletters. That might make sense. I can't say for sure, but that makes sense. Let's see. Unions were prohibited to talk about the union. Okay. I don't think that you're allowed to do that, to be honest. I don't think you're allowed to do that. It's it just seems unpleasant uh, there, so I don't know what to, to make of any of it. Hey, you, you're not going to be able to fit. Oh, well, you proved me wrong. OK, I've got blinds up here on this uh, window, and I didn't think that the kitty could fit between the blinds, but kitty found a way. Kitty, you want to be uh, on the show? No? OK, hold on. Hold on, folks. Um, I've got a kitty that sort of wants to play, so I got to move a few things so that they don't just sort of come tumbling down while the show is happening. Hi. Hi. Ow. Do you want to say hello? Do you want to say hello? Ha 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 ha. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Who do we? We got Jack. Oh, we got a big Jack here. Hello. I thought that you were Lily. So, um, that was it. That was it. I hope you enjoyed, uh, this, this brief appearance by Jack. Uh, he's still here, but he does not want to be held right now. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this guy. Who's handsome. You want to show the people your pretty little face? Look at how many spots I got. I got so many spots. I love this guy. I like uh, your your comment, Fran. Uh, 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 kitties, uh, uh, find a way. Ha <laughs> uh, ha. Oh, uh, ha <laughs> ha. Yes, yes. Mm. Jeff Goldblum. Yes. Yeah, they are big. Not even a one year old. And uh, getting big. They're great. They're great. So let's go back. Um, anyway, yeah. Image seems to be not making life easy for the folks in this union. They didn't want to ratify their contract in the first place. But uh, yeah, they, uh, they're not getting along there. Frustrating. I wish people were happier. Here's a stunner. Here's Harrison Ford as uh, General 
no, actually now President uh, Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross. I guess he's a big enough star that he was like, no, I'm a, uh, I'm not going to wear a mustache. And they were like, okay, yeah, Thunderbolt Ross always has a mustache, but uh, you don't want to wear one? Okay, yep. Thunderbolt Ross no longer has a mustache. Got it. And I also want all green jelly beans in my trailer. Uh, so Harrison Ford was interviewed by Esquire. Of course he was. He's got Indiana Jones coming out. Uh, they did ask him briefly what it was like working on an MCU movie. He's working on Captain America 4, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are... Uh, Tough days and hazy days and fun days and all kinds of days. It's a tough schedule and yeah, it's fun, but it's not a walk in the park. It's not fun, fun. It's work. <laughs> uh, and then Harrison Ford probably like uh, flew his airplane into a golf course or something. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, he is way up there. What is he? Is he 75? He might be 80, folks, just to be clear. He might be 80. Um, he's definitely playing a younger character than this, but he might be 80. It's work, folks. It's work. I like to think that um, he does not turn into, like, Red Hulk or anything, but they're, they're still, like, rigging him up in all sorts of uh, wires and just, like, throwing his body all over the, the White House set in his scenes, and he's like... <laughs> yeah, he's 80. Okay, everybody confirmed it. Yep. Oh, yeah, Mark Hamill does a great Harrison impression. He really does. But Mark is a great voice actor. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Harrison Ford should play Mumbles in the next Dick Tracy movie. He does sort of mumble these days, doesn't he? Uh, I'm excited to see... Uh, Indiana Jones, I, I hope it's good. It, it, it's not going to be as good as the first three. It's not, but but hopefully it's fun. Hopefully it's fun. He turns 81 this July. No kidding. 81. Wow. Hey, just to be clear, I hope I look this good in how, at 81. Um but he Harrison Ford's energy level these days is very different than Harrison Ford in his 30s and 40s. Just to be clear, like Harrison Ford in his 30s or 40s was incredible. You know, everything he did in like the 80s through the well, really like the late 70s, mid 70s through the mid 90s. Yeah, he had like about a two decade run where he was incredible. Work. Again, I, uh, I want my... I want my trailer to have nothing but cashews, but cashews from the mixed nut. I want somebody to pick out the cashews from the mixed nut container. I guess he's uh, flying the entire cast of Captain America 4 in his private jet to the um, red carpet. So uh, we can expect them all to die the night of the premiere. I'm just kidding. Uh, where was the news? Where was the news? This is important. I want you guys to be up to date. The Universal Studios uh, Marvel Islands of Adventure has expanded their Marvel store. Yes. They've always had a comic shop there at Marvel Superhero Island. And uh, the there was a smaller sort of boutique store next to them for a while that hasn't been used lately. They've expanded into it. It's a bigger comic book store now, folks. So they've just got comics and comic merchandise, even some MCU merchandise. Like, hey, we can see this um, backpack here is definitely in the style of like the MCU stuff. Um, yeah. You know, basically when when Marvel was going through its bankruptcy, they needed money. They sold off like their movie rights to a bunch of places. Uh, that's why Sony still has Spider-Man. And they sold off their theme park rights for... Uh, in perpetuity to Universal for everything like east of the Mississippi. So um, there's some things Disney still can't and maybe will never be able to do on their theme parks. Uh, whereas uh, as long as Universal Florida wants to keep it, they can. But again, 
it was licensed to any universals in any other places. So like in Japan, um, for 2024, they're shutting down the Spider-Man uh, roller coaster, things like that. You know what that store has? Pictures, pictures of Spider-Man. Merchandising where the real movie of the film gets made, right? Wasn't that a in a Spaceballs? Is that what you're quoting there? I think so. Merchandising. Oh, my flawless voice acting. Yes, yes, yes. This was interesting. There's going to be a new comic convention of sorts. It's an original comic book artwork convention. Uh, definitely smaller than like, you know, your big conventions. But uh, the first annual Original Arts Expo, they're calling it OAX, is going to be held in Orlando, Florida, uh, January, end of January, at the newly renovated Devil Tree by Hilton. That's uh, the one that's connected to Universal Studios. So it's almost like I put these two articles together because there was some tiny little tether connecting them. Uh, and they're going to showcase original comic art, illustrations, all that kind of stuff. They're going to have exhibitors like comic book art dealers. Uh, somebody earlier in the chat mentioned a place like Albert Moy, um, places like that. Um, heritage auctions, art representatives. I wouldn't be surprised if, um, oh, who's the guy that sells original art for tons of comic book artists now? All of a sudden, his name eludes me. Darn it. There's a guy that represents a lot of modern comic book artists. Um, auction houses are going to be there. They've got some guests, comic book guests, Mike and Laura Allred, Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor, Sean Gordon Murphy, Adam Kubert. I think uh, Bob McLeod and uh, uh, Bob Layton were listed. So a bunch of comic book artists. Tickets for like one day, uh, 85 bucks uh, for like a VIP three day, 275. Uh, is that a lot? Yes. But this isn't like a convention I think you'd go to for just sort of like, you know, fun and games and stuff like that. You're going there to buy pricey artwork that you're probably trading yep felix art thank you thank you dominic that's the guy i was thinking of i wouldn't be surprised if uh, felix ends up there but if it's your thing if collecting art is your thing i thought i'd at least put this on your radar you know maybe you could get a good deal on sunday before people are leaving i don't know another it's probably going to be a lot smaller than your typical convention but could be fun could be fun if I lived in like Orlando, Florida, well, first of all, I'd probably jump off a bridge. But if I did, um, maybe I'd go there. That's great, Void. Congratulations on meeting Mark Wade. That's 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 really nice. That's really nice. Don't they get commission? Well, I'm sure that the artists there would get commissions. My understanding is that they're trying to create something that would be kind of inspired by like Lake Como art festival. That's what I heard. I don't think it'll be that classy or anything, but yeah, that's what I heard they were going for. I finished reading the slam dunk manga, uh, about a week ago. And I loved it by the way, one of my favorite manga. I think it's probably my favorite sports story in comic book format. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Uh, the writer and artist, the creator of the manga, is he has adapted it into an animated movie. It's called The First Slam Dunk. Interestingly, it switches the main character from uh, Hanamichi to Ryota, the, the point guard. But anyway, um, the movie's already earned over $232 million in just China and Japan, where it's already been released. It also won the Best Animation of the Year Award at the 2023 Japan Academy Prize. So it's doing well. It's been well-respected. I cannot wait to see it. I'd be curious to see it, even if it got bad reviews, just to see an adaptation. Um, it's got a release date. That's the news. It got a release date. It's coming to American theaters like AMC's July 28th. That is pretty soon. I cannot wait to see this personally. Very excited. Um, and it said like in the description of it that it's going to focus on the team about to go up against... Um, Kogyo High School. So I think that they've shortened the story to basically just the final game that they play in, uh, where they go up against the previous high school that had won the nationals, 
which is an amazing, I think it took like seven Tonkabon volumes to tell just that one game. It was amazing. Just amazing. Come to Florida and see Rito, the boy who can read. It is going to be in theaters. It's going to be in theaters and not some sort of like fandom movie event one night only. No, it's going to be a, a release. I don't think it'll be a huge release, just to be clear, but I'm very excited to see it. I'm very excited. Let's see. Uh, Chris, I have two questions. It's not too many, all things considered. Which Indiana Jones movie is your favorite? Definitely Raiders of the Lost Ark. No question. And two, have you ever drawn indie before? I have to have. I'm positive I have. Yes. You know what? I know. I don't remember which year, but I I did on the Comic Tropes channel for like the first three years that I was doing it. I would draw something every day for Inktober. And I know one of those years I, I inked um, sort of Indiana Jones in like sort of his Temple of Doom sort of look with one torn sleeve and stuff like that. Yeah. How dare you? How dare you? Anyway, I'm pretty excited. Pretty, pretty excited. Pretty, pretty, pretty excited. This is huge news. I I was stunned when I came across this. So there's a gentleman named Ivan Briggs. And his job sounds like one of the best jobs you could get. He is the director of comics for PBA Galleries Auctioneers. So he's in charge of acquiring and curating and marketing the comics uh, auctions that PBA does. Oh, wow. Michael DeFonte. I'm working on comic tropes fan art. Yo, not in my style, but instead the 1990 image style. I think you may like it. I hope you find it funny. Ah, I'm excited. I'm excited. That's great. Thank you. That's really exciting to hear. Yeah, please send that in. Uh, shoot it to um, comic tropes at Gmail when you're when you when you do it. I'd, I'd love to take a look and uh, share it on whatever the next comic tropes episode I make is. So anyway, uh, here's the big deal about this collection. It is literally. Literally every DC comic book from 1934 through 2014. So yeah, like every, like pre-Superman folks, pre-action comics. if Like those ash cans, collected comics cavalcade, pretty sure those are in there. They've got a bunch of ash cans of stuff like Flash Comics and stuff that was created to secure the copyright. Incredibly rare stuff. I've heard some of it is... um what do you call that when like, um, like when you repair a comic restored, I, I hear, I heard some, I don't know how many, but I, I guess some of them are restored, but we're talking every DC comic. Uh, and the reason it shuts off at 2014 is that's when the guy who was collecting this, uh, sold his collection. It was assembled by a fairly wealthy guy, I guess, uh, music producer, Ian Levine. You can look up his credits, but um, I believe he produced things like Pet Shop Boys, which, ironically, the lead singer of Pet Shop Boys used to be an editor at Marvel UK. A little bit of trivia for you there from this nerd. Um, so he he just acquired every single DC comic book, every single one. In 2014, he sold it to somebody who is still anonymous, and then that person put it up at Sotheby's um, on auction. They want, they were asking $10 million. It was up there for five years. Nobody bit. Apparently it was even offered to DC comics to buy for their um, archive, but I guess it was too rich for their blood, which doesn't make sense. Cause they're owned by like um, discovery. They've got money. They've always had money. Just so many comics, over 40,000 comics. Over 40,000. It's a massive collection that PBA um, is um, has consigned. And um, yeah, so the, the plan, just to be clear, is, you know, they're going to be breaking it up into, you know, they're probably going to be slabbing the, 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 spe the most special issues like Action Comics number one. These are photos of like Ivan holding these actual issues. 
You know, like it's it's bagged and boarded, but it is not slabbed. My understanding is when Ian was buying them, sometimes he would buy slabbed ones. He'd break them out of the, those um, slabs and just have them them all collected like that. Oh, yeah. It's going to have like every Jerry Lewis. It's yeah, it's it's got all of that. It belongs in a museum. I wish I wish um, just a massive, massive collection. Um, oh, thanks for looking it up. Yeah, cool. 2017. Wow, that's a while ago. That's a while ago. Uh, just incredible. Yes, I am curious, Black. Uh, there was an issue where Lois Lane became Black for a story. Sugar and Spice, Space Cabbie, uh, you know, Phantom Stranger, all sorts of stuff. I bid $100, totally ignored. Now I have to bid $200, hoping for the best. But yeah, I guess they're probably going to end up um, slabbing these, selling off the key issues slabbed, selling lots. They're, they're, gonna, they're breaking up the collection. They're calling it the DC Universe Collection. It was known in fandom circles for a long time, even after Ian sold it as the Ian Levine Collection. When you assemble 40,000 comics, it gets a name. Uh, so it's got some provenance there. Uh, but Wow. What a collection. Can you imagine having that kind of money? Where and, and, and they were like trying to sell it for like $10 million. So I, I don't know. You know, even if you like have that, can you imagine like a $5 million collection? Just crazy. Hmm. Absolutely every issue of Warlord. Every issue of first issue special. Uh... $10 million is a steal. Action Comics 1 alone is worth 3 to $4 million. Yeah. But I think that that shows that, like, you know, not that many people have $10 million. And we don't know the condition of everyone. I'm not trying to say that every issue there is, you know, he probably did not buy, like, you know, a 9.0 of, like, Detective Comics 27 and Action Comics number one. I think that's why there's the rumors that lots of them are restored editions, but that's fine. That's fine. It's still cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I don't know that that specific issue was restored, but there's an excellent chance that at least its cover was restored. So it could look fantastic, at least on the exterior. We don't really know the condition of the interior, etc. Hey, Film Trek, thanks for jumping in. I'd love to go through the Wonder Woman comics. Oh, can you imagine just being able to just like flip through every issue of Batman or something? That would be so fun. That would be so fun. What about the Jimmy Olsen story where a planet evolves with old monster movies playing in the sky constantly? Yes, that would be in there, just to be clear, folks. Everything up through 2014. Every. DC comic. If you want to see just like a, uh, some more photos of this, what you need to do is go to Facebook, uh, Ivan Briggs. Uh, he, he, you don't necessarily have to, um, friend him. He has just posted the, a bunch of pictures of some of the, some of the stuff he started to receive. He hasn't even received the full run yet. You know, like this is a big, you don't want to ship it all at once. You want to manage the risk of something going wrong. So, yeah. <laughs> Marvin wants to Scrooge McDuck his way through the pile of comics. Yeah, if you're going to swim through comics, why not 40,000 uh, comics uh, by, by DC? I would have so much anxiety reading a comic that old. I think that when you get it, you don't necessarily, when it's that old, read it. That's what you know, facsimiles and trade paperbacks and stuff like that are for. That's what it's for. I wish, um, I wish DC had decided to buy it, and so that we knew that this was preserved as like an archive somewhere. I think that that would be a beautiful sort of story. But anyway, yeah, that's what they say, right? When you're collecting, they say better low grade than no grade. Um, I'm not a. I'm not a super serious collector of like things for just like, I don't, I don't need every copy of my comic to be in pristine condition for anything. So like when my cats did this, I wasn't happy, but I also wasn't like necessarily heartbroken. I was like, okay, you know, it happens. Uh, at the same time, 
I've never had a lot of interest in like if I saw Avengers issue one at a 1.5 for like, you know, 50 bucks or whatever it costs. I don't think I'd really want that personally. I don't know. <laughs> Extra money for gorilla covers. Hey, Rob. G.I. Joe, right? Yo, Joe June. Thank you, Robert. Wow. Thank you. That's really, really appreciated. I'm so excited to, to see how well this episode is doing with everybody. We've got over 200 people in the chat, which is a little bit more than usual. So apparently I just need to be high energy and have really gossipy stuff for the most part. That's what you all respond to. Uh, let's see. Chris, I went to Heritage Auctions based on your email and I ended up buying several slabbed um, Amazing Spider-Mans. Wow. Well, congrats, as long as it's what you wanted. Yeah, it's a thing in like sort of the fan community. We call it Yojo June. I I did. I supported it. Yeah, yeah. I don't love that companies now do things like um sort of their own crowdfunding campaigns, like sort of put the risk on um their customers over investors. I don't love that. But I will say that the HasLab projects are pretty special and impressive. Uh, I did back the one today, which just for folks that care, uh, they created the Dragonfly helicopter. As long as it gets backed, it, it's definitely going to get backed uh, with Wild Bill in the classified six-inch scale. I love, I love G.I. Joe. Love it. Love it. Uh, let's get those likes up to help. Oh, that's a nice thing to, to throw a super chat in for. Yeah, it does help if you just take two seconds to hit the like button that like really does help. So thank you. Anyway. Um, oh, you also got a crit Christopher Miller, by the way, let's all thank Christopher Miller for his fantastic work on across the spider verse, uh, along with, uh, Phil Lord, Chris Miller here. No. <laughs> uh, good name though. Yeah, you say Wild Bill, a.k.a. Frank Welker, uh, the, the voice, but, you know, my understanding is uh, Larry Hama specifically based a lot of the prominent characters in G.I. Joe off of, like, personality-wise, off of people that he knew when he served over in Vietnam. Um, I don't know if he's ever named the guy that played, that, that he based uh, Wild Bill on. He has put out a few names of people that he based uh, their characters on. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Thank you for playing along, sir. All right, come on, mouse button. I was surprised at this, but DC added legacy numbering to an upcoming issue that isn't like, you know, a milestone. And here's why I was surprised. Marvel started doing this first, and DC very much tries not to copy them. You know, Marvel, for instance, quite a while ago, added a recap page to the front of their comics. Um, DC doesn't seem to want to follow suit even though like marvel does it on all their issues but marvel does a lot of legacy numbering so that they like you know they might start a new series and say this is captain america number one but these days and i do like this they'll say and it's legacy number 805 whatever you know i'm just making numbers up uh so i wasn't surprised this past month when issue 135 of the current batman said that it was legacy number 900 i wasn't surprised by that you know, that's a big number that they want to say. They've Hey, they, they, we've done 900 issues of Batman. Uh, but this one is Batman 136. And you can't make it out well here. I didn't zoom in too much. But um, it says Legacy number 901. So I am wondering if that's something that they're going to start doing. Um, I, I would like it if they did because I do find that way easier to fill in any blanks on a storyline. You know, how do I know, you know, Mighty Avengers uh, number one from 2014 follows New Avengers from 2012? I don't know that. You know, it, it's crazy to follow the, this stuff. It, it They do not make it easy. Uh, mainstream uh, periodical superhero books. They do not make it easy in this day and age to follow. When I was a kid, was it intimidating sometimes to see like Spider-Man issue 297? Maybe a little, but it was it was very easy to at least fill in the blanks of where things were. 
and they would say something big on top of like an issue like, you know, like a new story begins. It was a jumping on point. Uh, let's see. Hold on. I think they should just make the legacy, the real numbers easier to keep track of. I think so too. I think so too. I prefer it. I prefer it, but maybe it's just me. Um, it, it seems like it does give them a sales boost by saying, you know, like, you know, flash number one with like a new creative team. So I get that they're like sort of starting a little bit fresh there. I will also say this. I'm really impressed with the dawn of DC creative sort of reboot that they're doing because it's a soft reboot. There's no big, there was no big event that like reset continuity or anything like that. They just gave all their titles, fresh creative teams, and they're not bogging any of their stories down in continuity they're, they're starting from a very fresh place they're not ignoring stuff but they're just not bogging it down i'm very impressed with the dawn of dc it's a really easy jumping on point for dc superheroes these days if there's ever a character or a creative team that you've liked i will say i'm really impressed i think that the dawn of dc is the kind of creative refresh that comics every once in a while they do and, and, and it goes well i think it's going to be respected like in a couple years, they're going to look back and, and, and go like, you know, the dawn of DC refresh was a strong one. Yeah, I found that a little confusing too, Void, because I like the excellent, but like they took a, a a bit of a hiatus and then they came back and we're calling it like the excellent number one. I was like, well, the excellent number one just came out like three years ago. Why, this is a little confusing, but whatever. But at least I was still reading that book in the moment. If I found out about it like five years from now and I hadn't read it, that's going to be a little confusing to pick up that run because I might pick up the excellent number one from the first run and the excellent number two from the second run. And I'd be like, huh, this story doesn't follow. So anyway, uh, so anyway, so anyway, but I, um, I do think that the Dawn of DC reboot is, is pretty strong. Uh, you yeah. Almost done. Two more pieces of news. And then I've got a few big comics to talk about this week. I, so there is still a few important things to go over. Uh, don't leave yet. Don't leave. Did anybody else watch the new season three on Netflix of I Think You Should Leave, the sketch comedy show with Tim Robinson? There is a hilarious sketch where he tries to do a pay it forward thing on a... Um, in a drive through at a fast food restaurant. I'll just leave it at that. I think you should leave, pay it forward. One of the funniest things I've seen this year. So um, my Hero Academia news. First of all, I've got a little tidbit here. Uh, in the latest Shonen Jump, uh, creator uh, Kohei Horikoshi, he announced that he's going to take a one-week hiatus. That's a big deal in Japan when they take a, a week off. Uh, although I think that that's just common sense to do that anyway. And then he said that, um, he's going to be pushing through to the finale. So we're, we are entering the end game. Meanwhile, we do know that there's going to be a live action adaptation of my hero academia on Netflix. Of course it's on Netflix. They, they, they do it all these days. Um, originally it was said to be a movie. Uh, the rumor is it might be a TV series. Now the good piece of news is it's written by, um, Oh, shoot. It's written by a guy who's written some good TV. I forget his name right now. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There was a French Twitter account called uh, Tokenim that posted a rumored live action cast list. I'll be honest. I think it might have been bullshit. I think that they were just going for like sort of current young actors because I, I didn't find this backed up anywhere else. I really didn't. Um, and then all these names got removed off of IMDB, uh, allegedly because fans were upset about the idea of casting all of these characters as non-Japanese people as all. So, uh, I really don't know. I really don't know. I like my hero academia. Um, it's, uh, I don't know that I really want it in live action because while it is superheroes, I think animation suits My Hero Academia better because there's so many characters. It's like a world where almost everybody has a superpower, even if they're not a 
active superhero, almost everybody is born with what they call a quirk or a superpower. And some of those people look pretty weird. Like they can have like mutations, just like in comics, you know, you might get like a nightcrawler or something like that. Um, you get people with like, you know, I don't know, a, a bird head or something like that. So I, I think like animation is, is the way to go, especially after we see how amazing something like a, across the spider verse could be, you know, stick with the animation for something like this. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Wally has pointed out that all comic stories are better in live action adaptations. So never mind. Never mind. I don't know what to make of any of this. This is just like news and rumors that's going around. Let me go to the last piece of news. And then I really want to talk about some of the big comics that came out this week. Cause there were a few, this one just came out. Um, we knew that Disney had cut uh, a bunch of streaming content suddenly uh, and recently, including things like um, Runaways, which I'd always intended to get around to seeing, but they cut that. Willow only just came out. They they cut that. Why would they cut all that stuff? Uh, well, it turns out that they that entitles them to a massive tax write-off. And I'm no... CPA, I don't understand the tax implications or anything, but apparently uh, in an SEC filing, it says that Disney uh, was now allowed to get a tax write-off of $1.5 billion for deleting all this content off their streaming services. What? What? But that's what happened with um, HBO Max, like, not showing the Batgirl movie. They got a huge tax write-off by agreeing not to show it. So I guess they, they get to declare that there's a value to it and that like by not using it, they get a tax write off. I don't understand it. I'm sorry. I don't understand. Um, I think that they could bring it back at some point, but yeah. Anyway, the SEC wrote that Disney is, um, and this is a quote, continuing its review and currently anticipates additional produced content will be removed and that those removals will equate to an ad additional estimated $400 million. I don't get how that works. I really don't get. I really don't. I uh, don't get it. I uh, don't get it. $1.5 billion? That's a lot of money. I can't even comprehend how big that amount is. I, I don't get it. My big fat face. Actually, you know what? I need to trim up my beard under here. But you know what? I, I'll be honest. I think I'm losing weight. I've been eating really healthy ever since I started dealing with my shoulder problems and stuff like that. I've been really, really diligent about eating healthy and I think I'm losing some weight. I'm being, um, I'm being kind to myself. It's a new thing. I'm trying. It's a new thing. I'm trying. Let me add something to the stream here. Throw on a light. That looks good. I'm not going to start with this one actually. What am I going to start with? Let me do two quick uh, reviews. Like World Tree is the new James Tynan, uh, Fernando Blanco horror book about something called the Undernet, which if you see it, if you see the secret internet, it drives you to become a, a crazed mass murderer. I don't know. It's still building up that plot. There's a good tone to it. I don't know if I love it yet. It's interesting. It's interesting. I like horror, so I'm going to give it a shot, but I don't know if I could recommend it too strong yet. Uh, Clobber in Time is a blast. Clobber in Time is fun. There is sort of an ongoing little bit of narrative, but mostly it is every issue is kind of done in the style of the old, um, I think it was called Marvel. What was it called? There used to be, it might have been called Marvel 2 in 1, which was like the thing teaming up with another Marvel hero. That's what he does in this, and he and it's written and drawn by Steve Scrochi, who's a really great talent. Uh, here's what's fun about this one: beyond fighting gigantic monsters and stuff like that, like you know, punching them until their eyes are popping out, uh, is there's a scene where we get to see Ben Grimm's rocky butt. Let me see if I can help you with that, okay? Because uh, I think that everybody, this is the panel of the week. This is the, where is it? Maybe, it, there it is. There it is. Ben and his wife, Alicia. Alicia Masters. He's getting ready for bed. He's cleaning up. He does put on a pair of pants. We don't get to see the front. But look at that. 
For the first time ever, folks, we get to see the thing's rocky butt. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's a very fun issue. It's kind of funny. It's full of just action. It's It moves at a good pace. This is a fun book. It's a fun book. I was so... Im I've got three more that I want to go over. Deep Cuts. This is issue two of a series... Uh, written by Joe Clark and Kyle Higgins, which is like it's fictional, but it's telling a bit of the history uh, or delving into historical periods in America, uh, the 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 birth and evolution of jazz music. And you'd think, okay, that that doesn't necessarily interest me. I'm not into jazz, or I don't care about history. I go, I would counter. Doesn't matter. You're gonna like this story because it's character based. And they involve that the character needs something. And there's like a ticking clock. So in this issue, you get um, Gail. And look at that art style. Kind of an Art Nouveau style, even though it's in comics, I, I think. Gail is putting together a Broadway play. Okay? She's a, she's a musician, a writer and an actress, she's getting her big break getting to direct a Broadway show in New York. But it's not very good, and it goes live in a week. She and the producer decide there's one way they might be able to salvage it. If she could write a hit song. It's about sort of jazz, so they need to create a hit jazz song. And she's only got a week. Well, she's going home over like for a couple days for a wedding, and she meets a couple people in Chicago, and, you know, goes to various jazz clubs, meets some really interesting characters trying to um, find her muse, trying to, to create that hit song so that she doesn't, it's going to be her only opportunity. You know, if this, if this doesn't hit, she thinks she's going to like fall out of the business. And it doesn't necessarily go in, in a way that you'd expect it to go. She meets a lot of different people, tries a lot of different things. I think that the art is incredible. I think that, you know, her her drive and her goal like feels very urgent and very personal and, and I want her to succeed. Um, but it is, does not go the way you expect it to, but it's, a, it's a beautiful story. I really loved it. I really did. Uh, I recommend it. Each issue just tells a full story in a different period. This is during, uh, late 1920s. I want to say, uh, prohibition era, um, dealing with, uh, Jazz in both Chicago and in New York. First issue was New Orleans. Turn of the century stuff. I've said uh, each month as I've been reading this Punisher run that I really like this Punisher run. Now, a lot of people that are uh, the kind of people that are putting Punisher logos on their cars are going to hate this comic. OK, they're going to hate it. I think it's a new angle. Uh, looking at Frank Castle, that works really well. Basically, uh, the evil um, ninjas, the hand, uh, got Frank Castle to agree to work for them in exchange for resurrecting his wife. We know that they can resurrect people. They've done it with characters like Elektra and Wolverine and stuff. They brought him back, uh, but he was too effective, basically. And uh, the superheroes like Captain America, Black Widow, Moon Knight, Wolverine, and uh, Dr. Strange teamed up to take him down. Okay. It ends with like Frank gone. Uh, we get backstory revealing that he, he has basically been the Punisher always. He did not have a, this retro retroactively recontextualizes things that, you know, like, yes, when his family was murdered uh, in Central Park by a botched mob hit, that got him wearing the Punisher uniform and sent him against organized crime. But he has always sort of been a guy with a temper and who was killed criminals um, that he did not have the perfect marriage that he thought he did. And that uh, anyway, it ends with, with Frank gone. Okay. Frank, the Punisher is no more at the end of this. I do not, I'm giving too much away. I'm not, I'm not, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. Marcelo says I'm giving away too much. And Tavia says, I don't like this retcon that it sucks. Uh, I disagree. I think it was great. 
I think it gave Punisher a more well-rounded uh, or Frank Castle, a more well-rounded personality. I think it fits with what we know. I don't think it changes anything uh, there. I think it puts him in a new position moving forward. Um, and um, look, There's been a cumulative effect where the Punisher has been coming out for like over 40 years, um, killing people. And uh, he, uh, there should be a price to pay for that. Even if you go along with the idea that like he only kills criminals, he's only success, like that's almost his superpower, right? Is he only kills bad guys. You're going to tell me that you can't try to like imagine that some of those people could potentially have been there because they are victims of circumstance, not to say like that they are all like every person he's killed has been the scum of the earth. All like the thousands at this point of people that we've seen him kill. Um, I'm just saying like, if you take a moment to try to think about it in some real world context, then maybe you don't need to, maybe, maybe that's too realistic for, for Punisher. But um, I think he's, I, I think he's a character that like needs a, a creative refresh. Uh, I have liked certain Punisher stories and I have not liked uh, certain Punisher stories. Uh, I really thought that this was impressive. Um, yeah. If he comes back after this, like, I guess you could say that that uh, black Phoenix, that, that it's a waste of time, but um, here's what I get at. I felt that over 12 issues, you get Punisher doing something different with his like sort of abilities. You get a new and, and you get some character growth because you get to see him interacting with his wife and in flashbacks with his wife and children. And you get to know more about Frank Castle. And I and I think most Punisher stories throughout the 90s would mostly just sort of flesh out a bad guy and then he'd kill them. It was rarely about Punisher himself, even when um, Ennis and Dylan were doing it. That was definitely good pulpy fun. I loved that run, uh, runs, but um, we rarely explored who Frank himself was, rarely. Punisher started as a villain. And I think he is a villain. I think he's, he, maybe he's an anti-hero, right? I mean, he he's tragic. He's tragic, but this adds to that tragedy. I don't know. Look, it's controversial. I get it. Some of you don't like this. I thought it was great. I think that this is my favorite Punisher story. I liked it. It was action packed. It gave me something new. It went in ways that I didn't expect. And I like to be surprised. I liked it. Moving on. I recommend it for what it's worth. The art and the story I thought was great. Uh, yeah, spoiler variant. This this information has been out for like uh, over two weeks, so I am going to get into it. If you know this, this can be basically the end. If you don't want to see who dies in Amazing Spider Man 26, uh, you can leave now. I'm going to get into it because I, this news has been out there, um, and people have had a chance to, to pick up this issue, and, and it's also just been out there um, across social media and everything. So I'm going to, to spoil it now. If you don't want to get spoiled, go ahead and take off. That's fine. Totally understand. But I want to like delve into this a little because this is kind of a big comic this week. Okay. So I just, just want to give you guys plenty of time. We're getting into it. You're about to see it. As soon as I pull this open, you'll see on the cover who dies. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it is not somebody from Spider-Man's cast, like say Mary Jane. Uh, it's Miss Marvel. Uh, Miss Marvel does not have her own comic right now. Uh, she has been a supporting character in Amazing Spider-Man. Kamala Khan works as an intern at Oscorp along with Peter Parker. So she has been a supporting character. Um, uh, boy, I didn't love this. I didn't love it at all. Uh, first of all, this is like, you know, kind of a big action thing out of nowhere. There's, there's a piece of it I like. There's a piece of it I liked. Uh, so there's this evil god, we'll call it, okay? And he's trying to kill Mary Jane Watson, which will like allow him to come to full power. It's a whole thing. Uh, he's being opposed by Spider-Man, his allies, the Fantastic Four, Norman Osborn as the Gold Goblin. He's like a hero now. And uh, Miss Marvel. 
Okay, so they're all trying to protect uh, Mary Jane against this god. He creates a dragon. There's all sorts of action. There's all sorts of like backstory, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we knew somebody important was going to die. And I'm, I'm moving forward to it because I'm just going to get to it. That's the important thing we're talking about is whether this was done well or not. Okay. So um, all the heroes have to like go up against uh, like these monsters that the guys created. And Kamala is tasked with just keeping Mary Jane Watson safe. Okay. So we see um, Mary Jane is making a decision to turn and fight the guy that's trying to kill her. But what happens? Uh, she gets stabbed. Okay. She gets killed. But here's the thing. Um, yeah, it seems terrible. Everybody's surprised, but his ritual fails and he, the bad guy goes away. Why did it fail? Because Kamala Khan with a lot of effort, she can shape shift. Okay. But here's the thing. Um, do I believe that Kamala is dead and gone? No way. She's one of the best characters Marvel's created in the last 10 years. She's, she, you know, she, she's really fun and cool. Uh, she's going to be in a movie in a couple months. I'm positive she's going to be back in time for that movie. Uh, maybe they killed her off so that they can bring her back on uh, the mutant island of Krakoa as a mutant instead of an inhuman. I don't know. Uh, how, how long do I feel it'll be before she uh, returns? What, what, let's see. It's uh, June, so July, August, September. Four months. Four months, maybe. I think she'll be back in four months. Because I know that this movie's coming out, and, and I've seen Marvel do this before with characters like Captain America and Doctor Strange, I have no faith that she's going to stay dead. So this rings hollow to me, first of all. Uh... I just don't believe it, you know? Oh, and, and if you can't b believe that she's really dying, it carries no weight. Like, death should mean something. Sure, you can use it in a soap opera sense sometimes. Like, you know, a minor supporting character seems to die in Spider-Man, and then he came back and was like, and is like, oh, I faked my death, uh, you know, or I I'm a villain, or, oh, that was my twin brother. You, know, you can do soap opera stuff, but this is clearly trying to present that Kamala dies. I this page, this reveal that she she had taken Mary Jane's place, it did fake me out in the moment when I read it. I did get some goosebumps reading this moment. I thought Zeb Wells wrote this specific moment well. You know, she's like she's dying, and she's like, "Did I do good? Um, you did great. You did so good." And she says sort of her catchphrase, which is something her father always says to her in all the various Miss Marvel stories. She goes, "I'm glad because good is." It's not a thing you are. It's a thing you do. Um, she dies saying that it's kind of her with great power comes great responsibility. Um, but I just don't believe that she's going to be gone for long. So, so what's the point? It's just so hollow and to kill her off in somebody else's title. I understand she doesn't have her own title right now, but she has had successful runs. And if you can't do a successful run with a, character like this she's got a fan base they would not be using her in the movie if she did not have a fan base they would not have made a tv show of her if she didn't have a fan base they wouldn't she has a fan base it, it, it's good um so i just feel like it's just so shallow you know like they were they were comparing this to the anniversary of the death of gwen stacy well that's a death that stuck you know that meant something uh this means nothing so not only do I not believe that she's going to stay dead, I've got reason to believe that she'll be back very soon. I've got further reason to suspect that she may come back as a little bit different, like, you know, with different powers. They may call her a mutant and have her powers match more what they've done with her in the MCU. That, that, that falls very hollow to me. Um, not right now. No, she does not have her own ongoing right now. Um, she's had good runs, but you know, a lot of characters get breaks here and there, you know, like they're not all Spider-Man and Hulk, um, you know, Dr. Strange or, or he gets breaks sometimes, you know, they're not all like that. Um, 
but let me take this pin. You don't need to see this guy. These will start getting like um, funded for the people that bought them on my um, Indiegogo campaign. Uh, but yeah. So they just shouldn't have built it up to be this much. If they hadn't built it up at all, this might have worked a little. If we didn't know that she was coming out in this movie, it might have worked. But Zeb Wells, who's writing this title, is also co-writing the Marvel's movie that's using uh, Kamala Khan. So, you know, he definitely knows what he's doing here. He's he's creating it. Um, yes, Kevin, it, it's it's no question. It's a it's it's like a publicity stunt. That's all it feels like. It It feels like one of the most shallow publicity stunts I've come across in a while. I just don't buy it in the, 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 the specific page or two. That's good dialogue. It's, it's good. Uh, she'll be back as soon as August. There's a classified solicit by Wells. I won't be surprised two months. How can, how can we be expected to treat death as a serious thing when it should be basically the most serious thing? How offensive is it to people who, you know, could be young and uh, maybe lost uh, a grandparent or something recently to then read a story where their favorite character is dead. And then they find out that that character comes back two months later when they're still possibly, you know, young enough to be really hurting over the death of a family member. You know, like that would hurt in, in a way if this was your favorite character. Real people don't get to come back from the dead. Um, I think that death should be treated a lot more seriously in superhero comics. I, I, I understand that there's a soap opera aspect of it just continuing. It's serialized. It just continues and continues. I understand that, but it's still treated just way too shallowly, way too shallowly. Anyway, so that was everything this week. Um, I didn't love Amazing Spider-Man 26, but I did love Punisher. Obviously, not a, it is not working for everybody, but I like the Punisher run. No, not AIDS. Uh, the original Captain Marvel died from cancer, and fortunately, Marvel has been respectful of that. They've used Captain Marvel once or twice with a story where, like, you know, it's a it's a flashback, uh, his son. Uh, or a time displaced version very temporarily. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I'm glad that some, some characters have that it would completely, it, that would be offensive. That would be outright offensive to bring back somebody that didn't die from like, you know, a super villain, you know, magically casting them away to the death dimension. If they died from just flat out cancer, that's pretty offensive if they brought that back, but they, but they didn't. Uh, Iron Fist was dead for a while. Yeah, Iron Fist was dead for quite a while. You know, at the time, they didn't think that, I, that they were going to use him. And if they don't think you're going to use somebody and you sort of mean for that to, to go away, but there's like, you know, an in-story reason to bring back a superhero. Look, I'll, I'll you know what? Let me let me re rephrase this. Um, I don't think it's ever really a cheat to bring back a super villain, okay? Because... Uh, it's it's less important uh, there if like you know the hero uh, seems to give the the super villain their comeuppance and they fall off a cliff or you know into some portal or whatever and they seem to be dead and then they they, they get out of it I don't care because I don't care necessarily what the villain has behind the scenes overcome to come back if there's a good reason to use them again. I don't care as much about that. I really don't. But when the main characters and important supporting characters um, die and then they come back right away. Right. Uncle Ben and Captain Marvel. I'm trying to think if there's any others who have, um, you know, for the longest time it was Bucky. Uh, but I will say Ed Brubaker did a great retcon. It was also a retcon when they killed off Bucky, just to be clear, because Captain America comics kept going through the 50s. And then in the 60s, um, Stan Lee retconned it that Captain America um, fell into the ice and that Bucky uh, died at the last days of World War II. That was a retcon.
con at the time. And then like further writers said, oh, there were a replacement Captain America and Bucky. They were operating in the 50s. But at the time that was like in the 50s themselves, that was not intended. So, you know, they've done they like a retcon like that is fine. Um, yeah, I don't know. OK, yeah. Um, Gwen Stacy is stay dead. Bruce Wayne's parents. Uh, you know, I think if it's somebody motivation their their origin story yeah like you know but mm. coffee yeah craven's death was fantastic I, I i don't love that he came back because that was actually done very very seriously and he did not die through some sort of big supernatural means he commits suicide and I don't think it's great that they brought him back that, that there's certain types of death um, that probably people shouldn't be brought back from. If it's something cosmic or supernatural or ambiguous, that's fine. That's fine. If it's larger than life stuff, you know, the Joker just can never seem to die. He's been shot and stabbed and blown up and stuff. He comes back and I, I don't care that much, but um, I don't love when, you know, somebody tells a meaningful story about a character and that's undone. I don't love that. I don't think Wonder Man is still dead. And if he is, he'll definitely be coming back in time for his TV show, won't he? Uh, so, yeah, Grant Morrison definitely intended for Magneto to die. That was like undone a month or two later by a different writer and the editors. They had Chuck Austin reveal that that was like an imposter or something, which, yeah. But Grant Morrison wrote a great story. This is the problem with ongoing uh, serialized comics by different creators. It's not all going to mesh perfectly, and it's unrealistic to expect it to. You have to sometimes just take the stories by different creative teams on their own merits and just go, okay, you know, I'll give you a gimme or two and, uh, and see if the story works with an internal logic. Uh, I don't know, Kyle. I don't know how he came back to, to be honest. No, old man Logan, I, I think went back to the future. Back to the future. Do, 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 do. I wish I had a uh, sound clips. They killed Magneto recently. I can't keep up. I can't keep up. Uh, I don't read tons and tons of superhero stuff. Uh, I do wish that they would treat death a little more seriously. It's a big deal. Or if you, if the, if the death is only intended to move somebody off the chessboard, that's one thing. But if you're telling a story about the death, that's a different thing. Does that make sense? If, you know, the only goal is we're temporarily removing the character or something, you write the death to be vague enough that like another writer could bring him back. And that's the soap opera drama. But if the story is about somebody's mental health or, you know, physical health, you know, cancer or, or suicide, those are the things that um, should probably be treated a little more seriously. But anyway, I think that's everything I had to talk about this week. Uh, I hope you'll give some consideration to watching my latest Comic Tropes episode that came out about Superior Spider-Man. I thought that that was a very interesting storyline that worked well for me, and I, I argue that case. I'm looking hardcore into the kind of new computer that I should get so that this stream isn't necessarily stuttery and has like even better resolution and stuff like that. I'm looking into that. Um, I've got some recommendations from people that, that are in the know. Uh, let's see what else is coming up. Uh, I'm going to do an episode about a pretty, pretty wacky, wild, weird Marvel comic that I found from 1991. That should limit you. Uh, figure it out. Uh, I'm looking forward to making that. I think that'll be a blast. So that's what I'm working on next there for Comic Tropes. We'll be back next week with more comic book news. I hope that this was a fun one. Uh, no stuttering today? Okay, good, good. Um, I'm trying, man. Yeah, I need a PC with at least 512 megabytes of RAM. Got it. Uh, not Sleepwalker, not Sleepwalker. Appreciate the content. I love it. Thank you. Thank you all. You guys have uh, really made my day. Oh, wow. It's already 730. I got to get going because my family and I need dinner. Uh, 
Take it away, Infotron. How about a devil salute? Yeah, devil salute. Boop. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. We'll see you next week. And until then, keep reading comics. Bye.